Collaboration platforms like Slack, Zoom and Microsoft Teams have become so popular in the last couple of years. Because of the wide adoption of these collaboration platforms, there are new jobs created in this industry to support and manage these collaboration platforms. The responsibility of a Microsoft Teams administrator is to plan, configure, deploy these team services on an enterprise scale. Teams administrators are the knowledge expert in a particular company who knows everything about Microsoft Teams. They have to be really well versed with chat, channels, apps, video audio conferencing, live events, configuring Microsoft Teams with Microsoft Teams certified devices, integrating Microsoft Teams with workloads like SharePoint, OneDrive, Exchange Online, Power Platform, or other Microsoft or third-party services. On top of it, Microsoft Teams administrators need to collaborate with network engineers and system engineers to effectively deploy and continuously manage their Teams environment in that particular organization. If you are a newbie to Microsoft Teams, don't worry about it. This course, I will teach you from the basics and then we will learn about how we can configure and manage Microsoft Teams on an enterprise scale. I hope you enjoyed this course and I wish you all the very best for your continued career success. So without wasting any more time, let's get into it. I have prepared this course with a mix of content, demonstrations, hands-on labs, and reference links. This course includes six modules. The first module is all about Teams Overview. You will get an overview of Microsoft Teams, including Teams architecture and related Office 365 workloads. In the second module, we will learn about implementing governance, security, and compliance for Microsoft Teams. In the third module, you will learn how to plan an upgrade from Sky for Business to Microsoft Teams by evaluating upgrade path with coexistence and upgrade modes. In the fourth module, you will learn how to create and manage teams, manage memberships and access for both internal and external users. In the fifth module, this is where you will learn how to manage chat and collaboration experience such as team settings or private channel creation policies. And finally, on the sixth module, you will learn how to manage live events, meeting experience, manage phone number and phone systems for Microsoft Teams. And finally, how to troubleshoot audio, video and client issues. In this lesson, we're gonna talk about overview of Microsoft Teams. Microsoft Teams is a cloud-based communications platform that combines different services for collaboration, such as chat, meetings, calling, and files. Teams is tightly integrated into Office 365 and combines multiple workloads into a unified communication and collaboration system. In addition, Teams offers integration capabilities for additional tools and third-party products as well. Microsoft Teams is the hub of teamwork in Microsoft 365 that brings people together in a shared workspace where they can chat, meet, collaborate on files and automate workflows. Microsoft Teams is also built on security and compliance tools of Microsoft 365, which enables you to join modern collaboration and communication together with today's complex legal and regulatory needs for your businesses. Teams meet the communication needs of diverse workforce by providing a complete meeting and calling solution, including chat, voice, and video. Let's look at how Teams help you collaborate. The deep integration of Teams with Office 365 enables today's workforce to use the Office apps they're familiar with. The apps such as Word, Excel, PowerPoint, OneNote, SharePoint, Planner, and even Power BI right within the context of Teams. Teams bring all of the Office 365 services together so that you can easily share and co-author files. Let's find out how Teams help you customize these services. Teams enable users to integrate their different everyday work apps into a single place for a unified work experience. Users no longer need to jump between Office 365 apps clients, and services. Because Teams integrated them all, both native and third-party apps and connectors. And finally, 
How is Teams helping you work with confidence? Microsoft Teams comes with an enterprise-grade security, compliance, and manageability that is already well known from existing Office 365 services. By using Teams, administrators can comply with modern business requirement and closely control how internal and external users work together. So what are Teams? A team is a collection of people, content, and tools surrounding different projects and outcomes within an organization. A team can either be private, which consists of only of invited users, or public, which are open to anyone within the organization. To achieve its goal of efficiency through a flat hierarchy, Teams only provides two user roles, which consist of owners and members. So what are channels? Teams are made up of channels. Channels enable users to organize a team into dedicated subsections for their purpose for keeping the communications and conversation organized. Channels are where you hold meetings, have conversation, and work on files together. There are two types of channels can be maintained within a team. The first one is called standard channels. Standard channels are visible to all team members. Therefore, they are available for conversation that anyone on a team can participate in. Private channels are similar to standard channels, but they restrict access to conversations, files, and apps to a limited subset of team members. This enables private collaboration within a project and department. Please note that private channels currently supports only connectors and tabs, but without stream, planner, or forms tabs, and they do not support messaging extensions and bots. This picture shows the structure of channels in teams of an organization. Let's look at what is chat. Teams provide an instant messaging feature that enables team members to send messages in real time for live collaboration. Chat is possible between single user and with multiple participants of a team, or even with external users. In addition, a simple chat can be instantly be extended with a desktop sharing and voice communication as well. When users join a chat, they can send messages that include files, links, emojis, stickers, and GIFs. There are many formatting options for chat messages, including options for highlighting, font size, list, and more. Guests can also participate in conversation but with limited access. There are private chat and channel chat. In summary, Microsoft Teams provides all the benefits of Office 365 services and tools in one single application. In this lesson, we're gonna talk about Microsoft Teams integration with Microsoft 365 services. So out of the box, Microsoft Teams brings together the most common tasks that employees need under a single roof such as chats, meetings, calls, and productivity suite of Microsoft 365. By combining these together into a sole product, employees can avoid having to constantly switch between various contexts. Instead, they can spend their time within a single team or channel that effortlessly bring together all the relevant information in context. There are multiple ways to leverage Microsoft 365 apps and services in Microsoft Teams. The most common scenario is to add a new tab to a Teams channel. Users can also add the content to a chat from Microsoft 365 services as well. So let's look at our first example of integrating Outlook with Microsoft Teams. The integration between Outlook and Teams make it easy to collaborate no matter where the conversation is taking place. The first option is share to Outlook. Users can share chats or channel conversation to Outlook without leaving the Teams by selecting on the share to Outlook. Second option is share to Teams. Users can move an email conversation from Outlook, including attachments into a Teams chat or channel conversation by selecting on share to Teams in Outlook. 
And the third option is actionable missed activity emails. Users can set the notification for missed activity emails to stay on top of missed conversations in Teams. The missed activity emails show the latest replies from the conversation and allows users to respond directly from within Outlook. Let's understand how Microsoft Teams integration worked well with SharePoint. In Microsoft Teams, users can add published SharePoint pages or list as tabs in Teams channel. SharePoint pages let users share ideas using images, video, links, and documents. SharePoint lists are a great way to collaborate on content and data. Team members can view pages, edit lists, and add comments to the Teams tab. Add the SharePoint tab in Teams to quickly paste in a page, new post, or list from a published SharePoint site. Let's understand how Microsoft Teams integration work with Yammer. Users are able to add a Yammer page to a channel in Teams or install then pin the Yammer app. This allows team members to follow and share conversation in Yammer without having to leave Teams. The team members can participate in the Yammer conversation right from the Teams or discuss a Yammer conversation in Teams before posting a reply to the wider Yammer group. When a Teams member goes to a Yammer tab, they can authenticate it again by Yammer so that they only see Yammer content that they have access to. Let's go and explore how Microsoft Teams integration with Forms. Users can access Microsoft Forms directly from Microsoft Teams. Then they will be able to easily set up forms tabs, create a new form to collect responses, and add an existing form to collect responses or show survey results. Then you can use that to collaborate with your team on a form, create notification for your form, or conduct a quick poll just for your team as well. So what about Teams integration with Planner and Task? Microsoft Planner is a task management tool that small teams of individuals can use to manage their work and associated tasks visually and openly with the rest of the team. Having Planner as a tab in Microsoft Teams enable the team to work more collaboratively and closer together without any added effort. Task in Teams is a cohesive task management experience that consolidates personal tasks from to-do and team task from planner into a single comprehensive view in Teams. For users of to-do and planner, it is a great way to access tasks while communicating within a team without having to switch apps. So how about Streams? Does Stream integrate with Microsoft Teams? Absolutely, yes. Microsoft Stream is an enterprise video service where people in your organization can upload, view, and share videos securely. Users can collaborate using video by adding a Microsoft Stream channel or video as a tab in Microsoft Teams. So let's look at some of the examples on how users can interact with the apps in Teams. The first one is chat with a bot. Bots provide answers, updates, and assistance in a channel. Users can chat with them one-on-one -on -one or in a channel. They can help with task management, scheduling, and more. Then you would be able to share content on a tab. These tabs help users to share content and functionality from their services in a channel. They can connect Microsoft services like Excel or SharePoint and other services like YouTube or Zendesk or to custom websites as well. Then you would be able to get updates from a connector. So these connectors send update and information directly to a channel to get dynamic updates from services such as Trello, Jira, Twitter, RSS feed, GitHub, and more. And these apps find content from different services and send it straight to a message. Users can share things like weather reports, daily news, images, and videos 
with anyone they are talking to. Messages sometimes include buttons for interacting with the app. For example, a daily weather report could include an option to download the forecast for the entire week. So now that we have understood how Microsoft Teams integrate with Outlook, Yammer, SharePoint, etc. In the next lesson, we're going to learn how Microsoft Teams integration work with Power Platform. Microsoft Teams is the hub for teamwork. The Microsoft Power Platform can augment this hub. Microsoft Teams groups all the information that users need for a particular context within various tabs in a channel. However, not all tasks can come fully formed out of the box. There will always be business or operational process that are unique to an organization that require tailored solution. This is where the Power Platform can come in to fill those gaps. Organization can streamline business processes with Power Platform with tools like Power Apps and Power Automate. Power Apps is a high productivity application development platform from Microsoft. The platform can be used to customize everything from a simple SharePoint forms to immersive end-to-end -end solutions. Combined with Microsoft Teams, Power Apps can be used to build modern workplace through custom tabs and apps in an app bar, all with little to no code. So what about Power Automate? Power Automate enables employees to complete routine tasks with less efforts and spend more time on more creative and innovative tasks. The integration of Power Automate and Teams streamlines the process to make the work in Teams even more efficient. Users can use pre-built template to easily automate common business processes. Some of the examples to leverage Power Automate in Microsoft Teams are to create and manage workflow automations directly from Teams. You can quickly trigger schedule flows using Flowbot in Teams. And you can trigger for specific actions when someone new joins a team as well. You can streamline approvals by aggregating and automating all Teams approval process in Teams. Let's understand how to leverage Power BI within Microsoft Teams. Power BI enables users to connect and transform data into accessible visualization seamlessly. Measuring and tracking results is essential for Teams to achieve their objectives. Users can visualize insights with Power BI in Teams and discuss data effortlessly to enable data-driven decisions. Some of the common examples on how to leverage Power BI in Microsoft Teams are, you can create Power BI tab in Microsoft Teams to make data-driven decisions quickly and confidently. And you would be able to create a Power BI interactive cards in Teams by pasting the link to a particular Power BI report. This experience will help users quickly find and take actions on their data. Now that we have understood how Microsoft Teams integrated with the Power Platform, in this lesson, we're going to talk about Microsoft Teams architecture. Multiple Office 365 services have been combined together to provide this unified communication and collaboration hub experience of Microsoft Teams. Before diving deep into architecture, we need to understand the basics. The basics is Microsoft 365 Groups, formerly known as Office 365 Groups. Microsoft 365 Group is the cross-platform membership service in Office 365. Microsoft 365 Groups are related to traditional Active Directory Groups. But while AD groups serve permission management and message distribution purpose, Microsoft 365 groups are built for collaboration of teams and not suited for granular permission management. Microsoft 365 groups support two types of members, owners and members. Owners can manage the group settings and membership, while members can participate 
with the group resources and subscribe to updates. Some of the resources which are included in Microsoft 365 groups are a shared Outlook inbox, a shared calendar, a SharePoint document library, a Power BI workspace, a team, a planner, Yammer, roadmap, etc. Teams provide features to enhance the existing collaboration services and features of Microsoft 365 group with additional communication services such as persistent chat-based workspace and voice. You can create a new team, which also creates a Microsoft 365 group, or you can enable a Microsoft 365 group with Microsoft Teams as well. And Teams adds several new features to Microsoft 365 group, such as chat capabilities for one-on-one -on -one and one-to-many instant messaging, uh, standard channels for open communication and collaboration between all team members, private channels for secure communication and collaboration for subgroup of team members, a dedicated SharePoint document library for any standard and private channel, a tab integration to a unified client experience, integration of apps, native, third party, and line of business application into a unified client, and activity feeds for easy access to your notification, etc. Let's look at the dependencies of Microsoft Teams. Teams utilizes the services of Microsoft Office 365 to provide collaboration and communication capabilities that were already well known before Teams existed. When you create a team on the backend, you are creating a Microsoft 365 group and the associated SharePoint document library and OneNote notebook as well. For example, Teams uses Exchange Online to send and receive distributed emails. It stores data processed by the chat services that is built into your Skype for Business, voice services such as conferencing and meetings. So this diagram shows the existing dependencies from Teams to the traditional Office 365 services. These complex dependencies result in different types of data produced by different workloads. Because not all types of data are efficiently stored in a single storage location. Teams uses the most effective storage location depending on your user data that is produced by each service. The following diagram provides an overview of types of data produced by using Teams and where they are stored. If you look at files, files are stored either in Teams files on SharePoint and chat files on OneDrive for Business. If you look at contacts, it's on Exchange, mailing information on individual mailbox in an Exchange database, voicemail on your mailbox in Exchange as well. Let's understand the governance, security, and compliance for Teams. Teams not only enables users to consume different Office 365 services and stores user data at the most efficient location, it also provides a strict approach to ensure governance, security, and compliance with regards to your consumption and processing of business data. This is done by applying the complex security compliance features in dedicated ways on all the data that teams produce. This protects against leakage and loss of business data by supporting compliant business processes when discovering sensitive business data. Now that we have understood the high level Teams architecture, we started with Microsoft 365 groups and we, we learned about how it is integrated with Microsoft 365 groups. In the next lesson, we're going to talk about Microsoft Teams integration with SharePoint Online and OneDrive for Business. One of the core features of Microsoft Teams is the collaboration service it provides through SharePoint Online and OneDrive for Business. When a new team is created, a new SharePoint site is provisioned, including subsites for your public channel created in the Teams. If a team is added to an existing Microsoft 365 group, the public channels are added to an existing SharePoint set as well. 
files shared in public channel are automatically added to the document library and permissions and file security options set in SharePoint Online are automatically reflected within Teams as well. So let's go and understand a bit more details about SharePoint site structure, how the site permissions work, and how you can measure the team's utilization for SharePoint and understand the difference between public and private channels. Any tenant has two unique namespaces. When a new Microsoft 365 group or team is created, a new SharePoint site is provisioned. So you can go under your teams and you can click on this ellipsis and click on open the SharePoint to view the SharePoint site. So when a new channel is created, a folder in shared documents is automatically provisioned. So the following diagram shows another example of how teams and public channels rely on SharePoint site collections and document libraries. When it comes to SharePoint site permissions, like regular SharePoint sites, the team SharePoint resources contain the three default permission groups, members, owners, and visitors. In contrast to pure SharePoint site collection, these permission groups on team site cannot be edited or changed. When assigning a team owner or members through one of the clients or through the team's admin center, the users are also added into a respective permission group. To view the permission of who got what access to a Teams, this is where you can find out who is the owner and who is the member of a particular group. Let's understand Teams utilization of SharePoint. So Teams is not only supports the manual upload of files to its document library, it also supports storing the following resources in the SharePoint Online and OneDrive for Business. So the file shared in the private chats is stored in the sender's OneDrive for Business. Any sort of pictures and the file sent as a conversation, it will be in the channel's document library. Any sort of email sent to the channel is going to be in the subfolder called email messages. So now we have understood the public channels Let's understand the details about the private channels. So when a team member create a new private channel, instead of creating a new site in the team site collection, a whole new site collection is created. And the creator of the channel is added as a site collection owner. So this following diagram shows how every private channel data is stored in an independent SharePoint online site collection. Please note that the SharePoint online site collections of private channels of Teams are not visible in SharePoint Online Admin Center, but can be seen via a SharePoint Online PowerShell module. Let's understand the site permission for private channels. If a member leaves or is removed from a team, that user will also be removed from all private channels in the team. Changes to the team like this that also affect the private channels that are synchronized within four hours automatically. Please note that all private channels need an owner. A private channel owner can't be removed through the team's client if they are the last owner of one or more private channels. If a private channel owner leaves your organization or if they are removed from your Microsoft 365 group, a member of the private channel is automatically promoted to the private channel owner. Now that we have understood the SharePoint site structure and permissions for public and private channels, in this lesson, we're going to understand how Microsoft Teams is integrated with Exchange. One of the core services of Microsoft Teams is Exchange Online. When you create a team, a corresponding Microsoft 365 group, which was formerly known as Office 365 Group, is automatically created behind the scenes. This group mailbox provides messaging capabilities and a mail-based storage location for data processed and created in Teams. For each additional Microsoft 365 Group that is created and associated with a team, a corresponding group mailbox is automatically created in Exchange Online as well. 
Every Microsoft 365 group that is associated with the team has a corresponding group mailbox in Exchange Online that provides resources to use messaging and a calendar for planning meetings. Data created in Teams is stored in different Exchange locations. When email is sent to the address of Microsoft 365 group, it is stored in the Microsoft 365 group mailbox and a copy is distributed to the user's mailbox for all subscribers. Chat messages and user's chat history are stored in their user mailboxes. Messages posted into channel conversation are stored in a hidden folder in the Microsoft 365 group mailbox. Meeting information when planning meetings for a team, the meetings are stored as meeting element in Microsoft 365 group mailbox. When a user changes his or her profile picture in Teams, the picture is also stored in the user's mailbox. Call history and voicemail messages are delivered to the associated user's mailbox. And finally, the configuration data for connectors is stored in the Microsoft 365 group mailbox. An example would be the connector data required to subscribe to RSS feeds. So these exchange locations support the security and compliance tools provided by Office 365, such as retention policies, e-discovery, legal holds, legal holds, and data loss prevention. Teams can be deployed in an exchange hybrid model as well, where either some or all mailboxes are hosted on an on-premises server or servers. In a hybrid deployment, Exchange must be deployed so that it's ready to use the supported Teams feature for storing and discovering data from on-premises Exchange locations. So how Teams work in hybrid deployment in detail is covered on later lessons. Now that we have understood how Teams work with Exchange Online and how Teams work with Exchange in a hybrid Exchange deployment, in this lesson, we're going to go through overview of Microsoft Telephony Solutions. The telephony features of Microsoft Teams have been developed to achieve feature parity to Sky for Business Online. The first step in the feature development process was completed in August 2018. Since then, Microsoft Teams has updated to provide a full featured communication service for voice communication into and from a wired telephony network. So the voice communication service that is implemented with Microsoft Teams incorporates the following communication components. The endpoints, uh, the PBX phone system, the calling plan or direct routing trunk, and the PSTN or public switch telephone network as well. Let's go and see on a high level what all these components are. PSTN or the public switched telephone network is the complete global telephone network operated by national, regional, and local telephone companies. PSTN provides the infrastructure and services for public telecommunications, including all telephone lines, fiber optic cables, microwave transmission links, mobile networks, communication satellites, and underwater telephone cables all of which are interconnected with switching centers. So what is Private Branch Exchange or PBX? A Private Branch Exchange is a telephone exchange or switching system that serves a private organization. It enables sharing of central office trunks between internally installed telephones and it provides intercommunication between these internal telephones within the organization without the use of external lines. The central office lines provide connection to the PSTN and the PBX permits the shared use of these lines between all stations in the organization. So let's understand what is phone system in Office 365. So phone system is the Microsoft technology for enabling call control and PBX capabilities in Microsoft Office 365 which is specifically for Microsoft Teams or Sky for Business Online. The phone system works with Teams or Sky for Business Online clients and certified devices. With phone systems, users can use Sky for Business Online and Microsoft Teams to place and receive calls 
transfer calls, and mute or unmute calls. Phone systems allow you to replace your existing PBX systems with a set of features directly delivered from Office 365. To connect phone system to your public switch telephone network or PSTN, you can choose Microsoft calling plan or your own telephony carrier. Let's understand what a session initiation protocol or SIP trunks. A SIP trunk enables an endpoint PBX phone system to send and receive calls through the internet. SIP trunking is a service offered by communication service provider that uses the session initiation protocol to provision streaming media services and voice or IP, VoIP connectivity between your on-premises phone system and the PSTN. SIP trunks enable internet telephony service providers to deliver telephone services and unified communication to customers equipped with SIP-based IP PBX and unified communication facilities. So what is direct routing? Direct routing is a capability of phone system in Office 365 to help customers connect their SIP trunks to Microsoft Teams. In the simplest deployment model, customers starts with SIP trunks from their telecommunication provider. Next, customers will use and configure a supported session broader controller, SPC, from one of Microsoft certified partners. Finally, they will connect the SBC to Microsoft Teams and phone system. So what are the operational modes for Teams voice communication? Microsoft Teams provide different features and functionalities for broadcasting, conferencing, and communication to PSTN throughout its licensing options and deployment variants. For example, a call to other Sky for Business and Microsoft Team users are free. However, if you want your users to be able to call regular phones, but you don't have the service provider for voice call, then you will need to buy a calling plan. So let's explore some of the general deployment options available for voice communication with Teams. The first one is phone systems with calling plan. Licensed users can call out to numbers located in the country or region where the Office 365 license is assigned to the user based on their user's location and to the international number in 196 countries or regions. Phone systems with their own carrier through Sky for Business Server or Cloud Connector Edition. This connect your own supported SPC to Microsoft phone system through Sky for Business Server in hybrid deployment or Sky for Business Cloud Connector Edition deployment on-premises. Enterprise voice in Sky for Business Server with own carrier. This connect your own supported SPC to the enterprise voice system in Sky for Business on-premises server. This is the most complex option to deploy and maintain. So let's explore the interoperation with Sky for Business. If your organization uses Sky for Business and you are starting to use Teams alongside your Sky for Business or you're starting to upgrade to Teams, it's important to understand how the two applications coexist. Let's look at a few of the options. Teams only option. This is the final stage of being upgraded. It also the default for new tenants. You can use Teams for calling and chat. You can use Teams for meeting scheduling and you can use Teams for channels as well. So what is island mode? So in an island mode, for calling and chat, you either use Teams or Skype for Business. For meeting and scheduling, you can either use Skype for Business or Teams. For Teams channel, you can only use Teams. This allows a single user to evaluate both clients side by side. Chat and calls can land in either client, so users must always run both clients. In island mode, all messages and calls from people outside your organization are delivered to Skype for Business. 
After upgrading to Teams only mode, all messages from calls from outside your organization are delivered to Teams. So what is Skype for Business with Teams, Collab and Meetings mode? In this mode, calling and chat goes to Skype for Business. Meeting scheduling goes to Teams. Teams channel is available under Teams. So the use case scenario is, it's also known as meeting first, primarily for on-premises organization that are not yet ready to move to calling to the cloud, but they want to benefit the Teams meeting functionality. So the Sky for Business with Teams Collab mode, calling and chat goes to Sky for Business. Meeting scheduling happen under Sky for Business. The use case scenario is this is an alternate starting point for complex organization that need tighter administrative control. And the final option is Sky for Business only. In this mode, calling and chat happens under Sky for Business. Meeting scheduling happen under Sky for Business. And there is no Teams channel available. This is a specialized scenario for organization with strict requirement around data control. Teams is only used to join meetings scheduled by others. Now that we have understood the overview of Microsoft telephony solutions, in this lesson, we're going to talk about overview of Microsoft Teams admin roles. Microsoft 365 provides a variety of pre-configured administrative role groups so that selected users can receive elevated access to administrative tasks within the Office 365 services. The role groups are assigned through different portals, such as Microsoft 365 Admin Center, the Security and Compliance Center, the Azure Portal, and PowerShell. Several administrative roles have full control to all the team services and settings, such as the Global Administrator and the Teams Admin. Other roles only provide access to certain part of Microsoft Teams, for performing recurring tasks, such as troubleshooting call quality problems and managing telephony settings. The specialized Teams admin roles are Teams admin, Teams communication administrator, Teams communication support engineer, and Teams communication support specialist. Please note that if the team consists of different workload from Office 365, the team specific administrator role does not grant permission to other services such as Exchange Online or SharePoint Online. So let's look into the task that each role can perform as well as the tools the administrators can use in the Microsoft Teams Admin Center and in PowerShell. So the Teams Admin, formerly known as Team Service Administrator, can manage the team service and manage and create Microsoft 365 group. So everything in Microsoft Teams Admin Center and associated PowerShell controls, including manage meetings, manage voice, manage messaging, and all org-wide settings can be managed by this user. Wherein Teams Communication Administrator can manage calling and meeting features within the team service. Teams Communication Support Engineer can troubleshoot communication issues within the Teams by using advanced tools. This user will be able to view user profile page and troubleshoot user call quality problems using advanced troubleshooting tool sets. And finally, the Teams Communication Support Specialist can troubleshoot communication issues within Teams by using basic tools. So that means access user profile page for troubleshooting call, in-call analysis, can only view user information for a specific user being searched for. Please note that the team service administrator role in the Azure portal is the same role as Teams admin in the Microsoft 365 Admin Center. So if you assign the role to a member in the Azure portal, you can also see that it is in the Microsoft 365 Admin Center as well and vice versa. Now that we have understood the various types of Teams admin roles, in this lesson, we're going to learn about overview of Azure Active Directory for Teams. Azure Active Directory is the cloud-based identity and access management service for your Office 365. As such, it's a vital part of Microsoft Teams. 
because Teams leverages identities stored in Azure AD for collaboration and communication. The license required for using Azure AD identities and for accessing Teams are included in a large number of different licensing bundles, such as small business plans like Office 365 Business, enterprise plans like Office 365 Enterprise E1, education plans like Office 365 Education, and developer plans like Office 365 Developer as well. So let's look at Azure AD Access Review. Because Azure AD enables you to collaborate internally within your organization and with users from external organizations such as partners, it is essential that organizations regularly review users' access to ensure that only the right people have access to the cloud resources. This can be accomplished through an Azure AD feature called Azure Access Reviews. Access Reviews enables organizations to effectively manage group membership, access to enterprise applications, and role assignments. Users' access can be reviewed on a regular basis to make sure only the right people have continued access and that no orphan permissions provide users with unintended access to cloud resources. So let's explore some of the common scenarios in the Azure AD Access Review. Too many users in privileged roles. It's a good idea to check how many users have administrative access, how many of them are global administrators, and if there are any invited guests or partners that are not being removed after being assigned to do an administrative task. What if the automation is infeasible? You can create rules and reviews for dynamic membership on security groups or Microsoft 365 groups, formerly known as Office 365 groups. This ensures that those users who still need access continue to have access. If you have a group that is going to be synced to Azure AD, or if you plan to enable an application for everyone in a specific group, it would be useful to ask the group owner to review the group membership prior to the group being used in a different risk content. For a certain resource, it might be required to ask people outside of IT to regularly sign out and give a justification on why they need access for auditing purposes. So why do you maintain a policy exception list? In an ideal world, all users would follow the access policies to secure access to your organization's resources. However, sometimes there are business cases that require you to make exceptions. Employees' access might be automated without some on-prem identity access management tool, but not invited guests. If a group gives guest access to business-sensitive content, then it's the group owner's responsibility to confirm that the guests still have a legitimate business need for access. Have reviews record periodically. You can set up recurring access reviews of users at a set frequency, such as weekly, monthly, quarterly, or annually. And the reviewers will be notified at start of each review. Reviewers can approve or deny access with a friendly interface and with the help of smart recommendations as well. Please note, using the Azure AD Access Reviews feature require an Azure AD Premium P2 license. Let's look at conditional access. Conditional access is the set of rules for access control based on various specifications such as client service, registration procedure, location, compliance status, and so on. This is used to decide whether the user's access to the company data is possible. By using conditional access policies, you can apply the right access control when needed to keep your organization secure and to stay out of your user's way when not needed. Let's look at Microsoft Teams group naming policy. Organizations use a group naming policy to enforce a consistent naming strategy for groups created by users in your organization. You can use the policy to block specific words from being used in group names and aliases. 
The naming policy is applied to groups that are created across all group workloads like Outlook, Microsoft Teams, SharePoint, Planner, Yammer, and so on. The group naming policy consists of two features, prefix suffix naming policy and custom block words. In prefix suffix naming policy, you can use prefixes or suffix to define the naming convention of group. The prefixes suffixes can either be fixed string like department or user attributes that will get substituted based on users who is creating the group. In custom block words, you can upload a set of block words specific to your organization that will be blocked in the group name that are created by users. For example, salary statement, human resources, etc. And finally, let's look at guest access. Guest access allows teams in your organization to collaborate with people outside of your organization by granting them access to existing teams and channels on one or more of your tenants. Anyone with a business or consumer email account such as Outlook, Gmail or others can participate as a guest in Teams with full access to your Teams chats, meetings and files. Guest access is an org-wide settings in your Teams and is turned off by default. Guest access is subject to Azure AD and Office 365 service limits. Don't worry, I have a demonstration prepared later, which I will take you through the demonstration on how to set that org-wide settings. There is so much more to Azure AD, but in the context of Microsoft Teams, I'm limiting Azure AD here, but you can definitely check out other videos on MS900 and AZ900, where I have explained Azure AD in a bit more details with demonstrations as well. So now that we have learned about overview of Azure AD, in this lesson, we're gonna talk about overview of Microsoft 365 Group. A Microsoft 365 Group, formerly known as Office 365 Groups, let you choose a set of people with which you wish to collaborate and easily set up a collection of resources for those people to share. Manually assigning permission to the resources is a thing of the past because adding members to the group automatically grants the needed permission to all assets provided by the group. When creating a Microsoft 365 group, you must decide if you want it to be a private group or a public group. Let's understand what is a public group. Any user in your organization can join public groups without the need of an administrator or owner to add or approve them. Therefore, content in a public group can be seen by anybody in your organization as soon as they join the group. Where in private groups, content in a private group can only be seen by the members of the group. People who want to join private group must be approved by a group owner. Private groups are separated into discoverable and non-discoverable private groups. So let's explore what is discoverable and non-discoverable private groups. Discoverable private group are types of group can be seen by all users of a tenant and users can file a request to join this group. Wherein non-discoverable private group these groups are only visible for users that are already members of the group. So there are different types of Microsoft 365 group. Let's explore one by one. So first one is Microsoft 365 groups. So Microsoft 365 groups are used for collaboration between users, both inside and outside your company. These are used when a collaborative workspace for a group of users is required, such as a department or users working on a common project. Distribution group is used for sending notification to a group of people. Distribution groups are used when sending email communication to a defined group of users, such as people in a building A or everyone at a particular company, etc. 
Security groups are used when granular permissions are required on SharePoint resources. For example, shared file repositories, a different team site, etc. And finally, mail enabled security groups. So mail enabled security groups works same as security groups, but includes email distribution to members. Mail enabled security groups are used to give granular permission to SharePoint resources and message distribution to members is required. Please note that mail enabled security group membership cannot be dynamic and cannot contain devices. Now that we have understand what is Microsoft Groups and what are the different types of Microsoft 365 groups available, in this lesson, we're going to talk about Overview of security and compliance in Microsoft Teams. Microsoft 365 provides comprehensive security and compliance tools and services to help organizations to comply with multitude of legal and regulatory requirements. Let's look at data loss prevention or DLP first. Data loss prevention policy is used to identify, monitor, and automatically protect sensitive information across Office 365 including financial data, custom search patterns, symbol keywords, and PII, such as credit card numbers, social security numbers, and healthcare records. Recently, data loss prevention capabilities are extended to include Microsoft Teams chat and channel messages. If an organization already has configured DLP policies, they can now add Teams channels and chat sessions as location to existing policies or new policies. This enables the organization to prevent people from sharing sensitive information with participants who do not have permission to view the information. Please note that in contrast to DLP policies for other workloads, DLP for Microsoft Teams is an advanced feature that requires you to have an E5 license. Let's look at retention policies. For most organizations, the volume and complexity of data increases daily, from email to documents to instant messages and more. Efficiently managing or governing this information is important. A retention policy can help organization either retain data for compliance for a specific period or remove data if it is considered a liability after a specific period. Retention policies are available in Security and Compliance Center, and they work across different workload and data types, such as Exchange Email, SharePoint Document Libraries, OneDrive Files, etc. Teams conversations are persistent and retained by default. With the introduction of retention policies, administrators can now configure retention policies to both preservation and deletion in Security Center for Teams chat and channel messages. So let's look at e-discovery. Protecting content from accidental or intended deletion is only effective when there are ways to retrieve them without violating legal and regulatory restrictions. E-discovery feature is for placing a hold on content locations relevant to a legal case and using content search tool to search the location on hold for content that might be responsive to your case. You can use eDiscovery in Office 365 to search for content in Exchange Online Mailboxes, Microsoft 365 Group, Microsoft Teams, SharePoint Online, and OneDrive for Business Site. All Teams one-on-one -on -one or Groups chats are journaled through to the respective user's mailbox. All channel messages are journaled through to the group of mailbox representing to the team. Information barriers in teams are used to prevent individuals or group from communicating with each other. They also prevent lookups and discovery. This means that if restricted users attempt to communicate with each other, they will not find that other user in the people picker. Microsoft Exchange include information barrier known as ethical wall that can be applied to the email communication through mail flow rules. In contrast to these ethical walls in exchange, information barriers also apply to chat, voice, and sharing services across different Office 365 workloads. 
users or teams can put on legal hold to preserve all business data and communication. When a user or a group is placed on hold, all message copies are weighted. Please note that placing a user on hold does not automatically place a group on hold or vice versa. Due to the complex workload architecture of teams, it can be difficult to understand what to put on hold when data must be preserved for legal case or investigation. This following table identifies some of the examples that may help with this situation. Supervision policies in Office 365 allow you to create employee communications for examination by designated reviewers. These policies can also help you overcome many compliance challenges, such as monitoring increasing types of communication channels, increasing volume of message data, regulatory enforcement, and the risk of fines. Alert policies built on and expand the functionality of activity alerts by adding a categorization feature to alert policies. Alert events are collected in a view alert page in Security and Compliance Center. This page provides an improved summary of suspicious activity in tenants, where an alert can be viewed and filtered and where alert can be acknowledged or dismissed as well. And finally, rights management services. RMS is the protection technology used by Azure Information Protection. This cloud-based protection service uses encryption, identity, and authorization policies to help secure your files and emails, and it works across multiple devices, including phones, tablets, and PCs. Because information protection remains with the data, even when it leaves your organization boundaries, information can be protected both within and outside of your organization. In the next lesson, we are going to learn about managing Microsoft Teams. The first part is how to roll out Teams. When deploying Microsoft Teams, you should create a rollout path that describes the high-level steps required to deploy Teams as a collaboration and communication hub for your company. Rollout paths typically provide a macro view of steps required for deployment rather than a detailed micro view. Microsoft recommends paths for rolling out teams including these following steps. So this is the starting point for any teams deployment, beginning with familiarization with stakeholders, with their new collaboration and communication client. Second step is chat teams, channels, and apps. This will help drive user adoption for Teams. You should look for a quick win in the deployment process. Third process is meeting and conferencing. Although voice communication and conferencing is used by basically every employee in a company, most legacy solutions cannot be integrated into Teams. Therefore, implementing meeting and conferencing in Teams deployment is typically performed in the later process of rollout. Finally, voice. The last step in a rollout is a full voice integration of PSTN calling into Teams. So before you begin your rollout, you should ensure that all prerequisites are met, such as environmental and network readiness. Only then you should start your deployment. You should perform the following step to roll out your initial set of Teams and channels. So the early adopters can begin chatting, sharing files, and collaborating. The step one is to create your first Teams channel, then onboard early adopters. Uh, you could monitor usage and feedback, and finally get resources to plan an organization-wide rollout. In the recommended path, you should plan and roll out different team features to additional pilot users. You start by rolling out chat, Teams, channels, and apps, because they are the most simplest workload. Of course, depending on organizational needs, it is possible to deploy them at all at once. This is where planning is so important to addressing your organizational requirements. What about migrating from existing Sky for Business to Teams? When rolling out Teams in an organization that already uses Sky for Business, you must consider initially implementing both systems simultaneously in a coexistent state, and then eventually migrate from Sky for Business to Teams. 
Please note that Sky for Business Online will be retired on July 31st, 2021, after which it will no longer be accessible or supported. Let's understand what is Microsoft Fast Track. With the Fast Track program, Microsoft provides guidance for planning, deployment, and adoption, including remote access to Microsoft engineering expertise, best practices, tools, and resources for successful deployment of Microsoft Teams and other Microsoft 365 services in organizations. Fast Track for Microsoft 365 help organizations and their partners accelerate deployment and gain end user adoption at no additional cost. When planning rollout path, you should also consider using fast track offers in your deployments. In the next lesson, we are going to explore Teams adoption plan. The following is a recommended list of high level steps that organizations should pursue to implement Teams and drive positive user adoption. These steps which can be altered depending on the size of your organization and will help you ensure a sustained level of communication with stakeholders, champions, IT administrators, and users to land a successful deployment for Microsoft Teams. So the first rule of a successful adoption is to create a dynamic team comprised of key stakeholders and the right people who can drive and affect change in others. The team should consist of committed individuals representing a cross-section of your organization. These key stakeholder roles include an executive sponsor, service owners, IT professionals, and champions. Let's look at who are executive sponsors. These individuals are key leaders within your organization, and their participation is essential for driving employee adoption. They have the greatest influence on the company culture and can actively communicate the value and benefits of new technology and business processes. Service owners are individuals responsible for ensuring people use the service and get value from it. Defining service owners within your organization is important to ensure the business goals set for Office 365 are realized. Gaining buy-in from every user across your organization is challenging. IT professionals and champions can help elevate this challenge and play an important role in the adoption of Office 365. They are knowledgeable, committed to furthering their expertise and willing to provide peer coaching and assistance. They help translate Office 365 into the reality of their department or team. It is very important to understand the types of users throughout your organization. Do you have users who are primarily mobile? Are they in constant meetings or giving presentations? Do you know which of your users have the most difficulty with your existing collaboration solution? This following table identifies some of the typical user profiles. Office users who work mainly in office who need to create meetings and calls. Sales reps who are the one who works externally, who uses chats a lot. And management or C-level people who works on sensitive data. Therefore, you need an increased security requirements. It is essential that organizations initiate a champions program. The purpose of such a program is to recruit early Microsoft Teams enthusiasts and provide them with both resources and reason to train their fellow users and evangelize the benefits of Teams within the group and organization they could influence. In this lesson, we're going to learn about Teams licensing. Microsoft Teams is available in different licensing model, from a Teams free license over the Teams commercial cloud trail offer up to subscription that include Teams and additional calling and voice and add-on licenses. At the user level, access to Microsoft Teams can be enabled or disabled on a per-user basis by assigning or removing Microsoft Teams product license. 
There are two main differentiation when choosing the design license. The core functionalities are available in all Office 365 education, business, enterprise, and developer subscription plans. Advanced features require an E5 plan and additional add-on on licenses. Some of the common services which include in E3 are DLP, Teams naming policy, Teams classification, Teams creation, etc. E would require E5 licenses for information barrier for Teams, audio conferencing, phone system, etc. So for audio conferencing, organization will need to buy and assign an audio conferencing license to each user who will set up dial-in meetings. For calling plans, each user will need a phone system plus a domestic or domestic and international calling plan. This table lists the add-on licenses available for Teams. There are add-ons for audio conferencing, toll-free numbers, phone system, calling plans, Teams rooms, and communication credits. It is important to know the licensing of other Microsoft 365 services as well. Please note that if users aren't assigned to SharePoint Online and Exchange Online licenses correctly, some Teams features will not work. For additional telephony features, Teams administrators should recognize from these examples. Starting on Jan 1st, 2020, Teams users will be able to send urgent messages with priority notification according to their terms of their subscription. When this new feature is available, some licensed team users will only be able to send up to five priority messages per month, while users with higher subscription like E3 or E5 will be able to send unlimited priority messages. Virtual users such as auto attendants with an assigned phone number do not require licenses to obtain the calling feature. These can be either a phone system or paid phone system user license to resource accounts. Beside licensing for organization, there are two special licensing models called Teams Free and Teams Commercial Cloud Offer. Let's explore those two in detail. The Teams Free Offer is in fact free of charge and intended for small businesses and consumers with a Microsoft account. This offer has the smallest feature set available and does not contain scheduled meetings, conferencing, custom email domain, or PSTN or admin tools. Microsoft Teams Commercial Cloud Trail Offer is a fully functional but time-limited trial offer. Each commercial cloud trial offer license include a set of 12 different standalone licenses such as Exchange Foundation and SharePoint Online Kiosk with 2 GB of storage in SharePoint Online. Now that we have understood the Teams licensing model, the next lesson we are going to explore planning for Teams governance. Microsoft Teams provide a rich set of tools to implement governance capabilities for organization. When planning for governance, you should consider the following areas. Group and team creation, naming, classification, and guest access. How do you manage Teams feature management? And how are you going to manage group and Teams expiration, retention, and archiving, etc.? To quickly implement governance in Teams, organizations should focus on these areas. Who can create the group within your organization? What sort of a naming convention you want to set as a template for your organization? What meeting capabilities you would like to provide for your users? Do you want to include any sort of external third-party apps to be approved? Or do you want to enable guest access or external user access within your team's collaboration platform? And how are you going to manage and maintain your data security within your teams? Organization oftentimes implement strict controls on how teams are named and classified, whether guests can be added as team member and who can create teams, etc. You can configure each of these area by using Azure Active Directory. This is the following table, which includes some of the questions you should consider when planning for group and tenant creation policies. Does your organization require a specific naming conversion? Do team creators need the ability to assign organization-specific classification to teams? Does your organization require limiting who can create teams? 
or do you need to restrict the ability to add guest teams on per teams basis as well? Please note that limiting groups and team creation can slow your user's productivity because many Office 365 services require that groups to be created for services to function. So after you have determined your requirements, you can implement them by using Azure AD controls. Then organizations might have additional requirements for setting policies for exploration, retention, and archiving teams and teams data. Group expiration policies can be configured to automatically manage the life cycle of a group and retention policies to preserve or delete information as needed. Teams can also be archived to preserve a point in time view of teams that no longer actively require you to use. So some of the things you need to consider are listed down in this table. Some of the questions you need to ask are, do you require specifying an expiration date for teams? Do you require specific date retention policies to be applied to teams? Does organization expect to require the ability to archive inactive teams to preserve the content in a read-only state? Another important aspect of governing and lifecycle management for teams is the ability to control what features users will have access to. Messaging, meeting, and calling features can be managed either at Office 365 tenant level or per user level as well. So some of the things you need to consider are, do you require limiting Teams features to your user tenant? Do you require limiting Teams features for a specific user as well? Once you have identified your Teams governance topic, you should consider the following steps to develop a governance roadmap for your team's rollout project. Things like document your organizational requirement, plan to implement your specific requirement, and communicating and publishing your policies to inform your team's users and behavior they can expect. Planning for lifecycle management is essential for organization to get the most out of Microsoft Teams. Like most projects, Creation and management of teams passes through beginning, middle, and end stages. However, Teams has such a variety of users that it may not always be obvious which stage a project is in. Having a plan for lifecycle management will help track an organization's project as they go through these stages. In Teams, individual users have its sole lifecycle within the following sequence. Initiate, Active, and Sunset. The key decision points to consider the beginning stages include what's the team's purpose? Who belongs on the team? Will the team be private or public? Who will have permission to create channels? What initial channel will be added to the teams, etc. The decision points that should be considered in the stage of middle stage include who will monitor usage to identify problems? What metrics will be used to determine team's health? Identify any teams that have reached the end of their useful life. And important decisions point related to the end stage include defining what the end of team's life look like, documenting best practices and lessons learned, archiving data if necessary, etc. You can configure and manage the team's life cycle through the team's admin center the Office 365 Admin Center, and Azure AD Admin Center as well. If you wish to automate specific management tasks throughout the team's lifecycle, you can do so by using PowerShell and Graph API automation tools as well. So this is the diagram which shows you about all the type of automation you can enable during different lifecycle within Teams. Now that we have learned about how to govern Teams and what are the life cycle stages of teams? In the next lesson, we're gonna explore teams management tools. Managing the various aspects of Microsoft Teams can be performed using variety of tools. Basic tasks such as creating and editing team settings and adding or removing members and adding or removing and configuring app all can be performed by users within the Teams client app. Administrators tasks can be performed using Teams Admin Center and Teams Partial Module or Graph API. So what is Teams Admin Center? 
Microsoft Teams Admin Center is available from your Microsoft 365 Admin Center or navigating to admin.teams.microsoft.com. The Microsoft Teams Admin Center provides a dashboard that shows Teams usage and user activity in your organization. The Teams Admin Center enables administrators to manage and create Teams to create Teams policies, manage phone devices, telephony numbers, location and emergency addresses, and meeting settings and policies such as live event settings and policies, messaging policies, Teams app settings, etc. The portal also provides link to legacy portal for call quality dashboard and troubleshooting. To access the Team Admin Center, users must be assigned to one of the following administrative roles. The user has to be either Global Administrator, Teams Admin, Teams Communication Admin, or Skype for Business Admin. You can use Teams PowerShell modules to manage Teams as well. To use Windows PowerShell to run Teams-related commands, you must first install the Teams PowerShell module by running the following command which is install module dash name Microsoft Teams. After installing the module, it is loaded into all new PowerShell sessions and the commandlets are available for configuring policies and settings, such as creating and managing Teams. Before you can work with the Teams PowerShell module, you must establish a connection to the tenant by running the following commandlets, which is connect dash Microsoft Teams. Please note that the Teams PowerShell module is still under development and transitioning from Sky for Business PowerShell module to the Teams one. So what is Teams Graph API? Microsoft Teams also provides management capabilities through Microsoft Graph, where Teams is represented by a group resource. The Graph API can be used for various tasks regarding managing team settings, members, and resources. The primary use of Graph API is its automation. Because Graph API calls can be embedded into tabs pages and easily call from other resources. Now that we have explored various types of Teams management tools, in this lesson, we're going to talk about Teams clients. Microsoft Teams has clients available for desktop which is Windows, Mac, and Linux, web, and mobile, which is Android and iOS. It's integrated with communications and meeting rooms devices for frictionless experience, no matter which device user work from. All clients require an active internet connection and do not support an offline mode. Let's explore the desktop clients. The Microsoft Teams desktop client provides a fully featured experience including real-time communication support for Teams meetings, group callings, and private one-on-one -on -one calls as well. Advantages of Teams desktop client include Auto Start, which ensures that you will always stay signed in and won't miss any important notification. These desktop clients can be installed either individually by users or rolled out by IT administrator in a mass deployment. The Microsoft Teams desktop client for Windows is available on 32-bit and 64-bit ar architecture. And this can be installed on Windows 8.1 or later and Windows Server 2012 or later. Additionally, Teams require .NET Framework 4.5 or later. Mac users can install Teams by using PKG installation file for Mac computers. Any Mac operating system version which is above 10.10 .10 or later. Administrative access is required to install Mac client. The Mac operating system client is installed to the application folder. Microsoft Teams is now available for Linux users as a public preview. Teams on Linux enables high quality collaboration experience for the open source community. You can download the native Linux package in .deb and .rpm formats. What about web client? The web client is a fully functional client that can be used from a variety of browsers. The browser must be configured to accept third-party cookies. 
There is no plugin or download required to run Teams in a web browser. This web client performs a browser verification. And if an unsupported browser version is detected, it will block access to the web interface. Some of the browsing capabilities for Teams include like if you are using Internet Explorer 11, calling and audio video sharing is not supported. If you use, if you use Edge, it supports all functionalities. If you use Google Chrome, everything is fully supported. Firefox, the calling and audio and video calling is not supported. And Safari also calling and audio and video sharing is not supported. So the fully supported browsers are Edge and Chrome. Let's explore the mobile clients. Microsoft Teams mobile app are available for Android and iOS platform. They're targeted to the on-go users who participate in chat-based conversation and they enable peer-to-peer -peer audio calls. The mobile app can be downloaded directly from their respective vendor mobile stores, such as Google Play Store and Apple App Store. Android support is limited to the last four major versions of Android. When a new major version of Android is released, the new version and the previous three versions are officially supported. iOS support is limited to the two major recent major versions of iOS. When a new major version of iOS is released, the new version of iOS and the previous version are officially supported. In this lesson, you're going to learn about how to plan for governance in Microsoft 365 Group. Microsoft 365 Groups, which was formerly known as Office 365 Group, is a cross-application membership service in Office 365. It's an object in Azure Active Directory so organizations can add or remove people from the group just as any other group-based service object in Active Directory. With Microsoft 365 Group, organizations can give a group of people access to collection of collaboration resources, including shared Outlook inbox, shared calendar, SharePoint document library, etc. A Microsoft 365 group can be created directly from your Microsoft 365 admin center or indirectly from other associated workload, such as planner or a team. And Office 365 has a rich set of tools to manage and govern Microsoft 365 group at scale. Some of the capabilities of Microsoft 365 groups are group naming policy, group classification, group guest access, group creation, hidden membership, and expiration policies. There are many ways to create Microsoft 365 Group. I will take you through a demo walkthrough on the next video to exactly show you how to create a Microsoft 365 Group. So when you create a Microsoft 365 Group, there are a few other things which is created along with that. There is going to be an associated SharePoint document library, you will get a OneNote notebook and connection to other Office 365 cloud applications as well. Administrators in your Office 365 tenant can also create and manage Microsoft 365 group in their specific admin center. Now that we have learned on a high level on what is Microsoft 365 group, in this lesson, we are going to go through a demonstration on how to create and manage Microsoft 365 groups for Teams. There are a few tasks we are going to go through in this demonstration. The first is how to create a Microsoft 365 group in the admin portal, then how to update a distribution list, and strategies for Microsoft 365 group creation, and how do you manage a Microsoft 365 group. So to create a Microsoft 365 group, we have to go to Microsoft 365 Admin Center, you can go to the portal called admin.microsoft365.com and on the left hand side, you can find users, groups, roles, resources, etc. So click on groups and you will be able to find all the available groups within your subscription. You can click on type to find out what types of groups it's available, like security group, Microsoft 365 group, distribution list, etc. So to create a new group, click on add a group and select the type as Microsoft 365. This allows teams to collaborate by giving them a group email and shared workspace for conversation, files, and calendars. Give a name to your group. 
I'm going to call this group as MS 700 Microsoft 365 group. Click next. You would have to assign an order, ideally two orders. So I'm going to assign one order. I assigned Rick as the owner of the group. You have options like, do you want to make this a public group where anyone can see the group and content, or you can create as a private as well. Additionally, you have an option to add a Microsoft Teams to your group as well. So I'm going to select yes. If you want to have an email address for your group, you can create that as well. So I'm going to give a name and I'm going to make it a public group. Click next. You can review the details like group type, group name and description, who is the owner of the group, does it have an email address, What's the privacy setting? Is it public or private? And do you need a Teams site created for this as well? And hit on create a group. So now that we have created our group, I can click on close or I can go and create another group as well. So let's close it and go refresh. Now that we have created the group, let's go and add a member to the group. So before that, I'm gonna change the mode to dark. So let's go and search for the group we just created. Select the group. Click on members. As you can see that there is no member as of now. View all and manage member. So this is where you would be able to search for a member. So I'm going to add a new member to the group. So I'm going to search for body. And save and close. Now you can see that there is an owner and there is a member to the group as well. So this is how you can create a Microsoft 365 group and assign an owner and a member for the group. The next task is to upgrade a distribution list to a Microsoft 365 group. To upgrade a distribution list, we have to go to Exchange Admin Center. So we can go to Microsoft 365 Admin Center. Under the Admin Center, you can click on Exchange. This takes you to the Exchange Admin Center. You need to be a global administrator to perform this activity. Under the Exchange Admin Center, you can go under Recipients and go click on Groups. So let me yeah, under recipients, you need to click on groups. Under groups, you will see a notice indicating that you have distribution list and also called distribution groups that are eligible to be upgraded to Microsoft 365 group. So you can select one or more distribution list from this group page below. And after you select a group, you can click on start upgrade. So the process begins immediately. Depending on the size and the number of deals, this process can take several minutes or up to some hours as well. If the distribution list can't be upgraded, a dialog box appears with a notification. If you are upgrading multiple distribution lists, use the drop-down list to filter which distribution list you want to be upgraded. And the third task is strategies for Microsoft 365 group creation. So organizations may have specific requirements about who can create Microsoft 365 group. Some of the provisioning models are open, IT-led, and controlled. Most of it can be controlled via PowerShell. So I'm not going to demonstrate that. We're going to move on to the fourth task, which is called Manage a Microsoft 365 group. To manage a Microsoft 365 group, you go back to your admin.microsoft.com. Under the admin center, just find groups. And under the groups, you would be able to find all the groups available. To manage a group, select a group you would like to manage. And this is where you can see information like basic information, like what's the group name. Description you can modify over here. If you go under email, this is where you can add a new alias for your existing group. Under Members tab, where you can find who's the owner of the group, who is the member of the group, etc. This is where you can add or remove new owners and new members. 
Under settings is where you can define the setting permissions for these groups. Like, would you like to allow external sender access to the email? Would you like to get a copy of this group conversation? Would you like to hide it from the organizational group address, etc.? And finally, you can enable private or public with this control pane. The last option is if you do happen to have a group, you can create a Microsoft Teams within that group as well. So that's how you create and manage a Microsoft 365 group. So I hope the information provided in this demo was useful. In the next video, we're going to talk about Microsoft 365 groups classification. So when creating Microsoft 365 groups, you might want to add information about the group's purpose. For example, you might want to inform the users what type of documents are stored within the group. This types of group functionality is called group classification. You can configure group classification so that when users in your company create a group, they can choose a classification as well. You can configure group classification so that when users in your company create the group, they can choose a classification as well. For example, when a user create a group, the user can choose from classification from standard, internal, and confidential. Group classification does not exist by default. So administrators will need to create this group classification so that users can use when they create a group. So how do you enable and configure Microsoft 365 group classification? Before users can use classification on Microsoft 365 groups, an administrator need to define classification by using Azure Active Directory PowerShell commandlets. You need to install the latest version of Azure AD Preview commandlet. And then next, you need to associate a description to each classification by using settings attribute and classification descriptions. It might take up to an hour until the classification settings are available for all users. And once the Microsoft 365 Groups classification has enabled, you can configure the classification to a group from Outlook or Teams client. You can see on the image below. So this is where you can go and modify and select the right classification. In this lesson, we're going to go through a demonstration on how to configure Microsoft 365 Groups expiration policy. Typically, people in organizations work on different projects and collaborate with different departments. It is common that users are added to many Microsoft 365 groups. Sometimes the projects are finished, but the Microsoft 365 groups still exist. Regarding this, the administrators and users need a way to clean up the unused groups. The most optimal solution for this is to set an expiration policy, which helps to remove inactive groups from the system. The expiration is turned off by default. The administrators have to enable the feature in the tenant and specify the expiration period for the group. When approaching group expiration, an email notification will be sent to the group owners if renewal is needed for additional period. If the group is not renewed, the group will be deleted automatically. If the administrator changes the expiration policy, the Office 365 expiration period will be recalculated for the groups. It is very important to know that when a group expires, all the group's associated content will be deleted, including Outlook, Planner, and SharePoint. However, there is an option to recover content up to 30 days from the expiration period. So let's go and see how to configure Microsoft 365 Group Expiration Policy. To configure Microsoft 365 Group Expiration Policy, you will have to log in to Azure AD Admin Center as a global administrator. So I'm going to go under my Azure Active Directory, click on Groups. On the left hand side under Settings for Groups, you can find there is something called Expiration. So click on Expiration. And by default, this is turned off. So this is where you can select the lifetime in days. So I'm going to put 180 days. So you have by default 180 and 365 days, or you can have a custom date as well. So I'm going to select 180. 
Then there is email contact for groups with no owners. So this is where you can specify an email address where the renewal and expiration notification should be sent when a group has no owner. If the group does not have an owner, the expiration email will go to the specified administrator. So I'm going to provide my tenant administrator email address here. And finally, enable expiration for these Microsoft 365 groups. You have options like all selected and none. So select the Microsoft 365 groups, which you would like to configure this expiration policy for. So let's suppose you would like to enable this option to this group. You can select that and select. So the policy will be set for this particular group we selected. To finish the settings, you can click on save and that finishes the setting. Let's understand who can configure and use the Microsoft 365 groups expiration policy. A group expiration is a feature that is included in an Azure AD premium subscription. This license is required for the administrator who needs to configure the settings and the members of the affected groups. They will need to have Azure AD premium licenses assigned to them. There are typically two types of roles within an organization which has different privileges when it comes to expiration policies. Office 365 Global Admin and User Administrator. Now that we have learned about how to create an expiration policy, in this demonstration, we are going to go through how to configure Microsoft 365 Groups naming policy. So organization can use a group naming policy to enforce consistent naming strategy for groups created by users. A naming policy can help users identify the function of the group, membership, geographic region, or the person who created the group. The naming policy is applied to groups that are created across all Office 365 apps, such as Outlook, Teams, SharePoint, Planner, Yammer, and it applies for the group name and group aliases as well. So the group naming policy consists of the following feature. Prefix suffix naming policy and custom block words. You can use prefixes or suffixes to define the naming convention of groups. For example, if you configure GRP as prefix, this will create the marketing group as GRP marketing. Custom block words, you can also specify a variety of words that will be blocked in groups created by users, such as GM, billing, payment, HR, etc. So let's go and see how to configure Microsoft 365 Groups naming policy from an Azure Admin Center. So I logged into my Azure portal using my global administrator. Select the Azure Active Directory and right under the Manage, select Groups. Under Settings for the group, there is naming policy. Select that. So under block words, this is where you would be able to upload a list of words you wish to block or prevent from Microsoft 365 Group. So first step is you can download the CSV of block words. As of now, this is empty. This is where you would be able to add all the block words like HR, And you can add up to 5,000 words and you can, you can go and basically select the file and upload the file or you can save it. The next option is group naming policy. So this Microsoft 365 group naming policy is the one which is going to allow you to add a specific prefix or suffix to the group name and aliases for the Microsoft 365 group name. So you can add a prefix by going and selecting a prefix by selecting an attribute or a string. I'm going to select as an attribute, I'm going to select as department or a string called HR. And as a suffix, again, an attribute. This time, I'm going to select a country or region, a string as New Zealand. And you can save that. So this is how you can create a prefix 
add suffix and a block word for your Microsoft 365 group. The total prefixes and suffixes string length is restricted to maximum of 53 characters. And prefixes and suffixes can contain special characters in the group name as well. If you are using Yammer Office 365 connected groups, avoid using following characters in your naming policy like at the rate, hash, brackets. If these characters are there in your naming policy, regular Yammer users will not be able to create these groups. Now that we have learned about Teams naming policy and block words, in this demo walkthrough, we're going to see how to access Teams reports. In order to access Teams usage report, you need to have one of the following roles assigned. Office 365 Global Admin, Teams Service Admin, Teams Communication Admin, or Skype for Business Admin. You can access this report by going into Microsoft Teams Admin Center. And some of the reports you can access from the Teams Admin Center are Usage activity, device usage, Teams usage, live event usage, PSTN usage, and PSTN block usage, etc. I'm now in my Teams Admin Center. You can access Teams Admin Center by going into admin.teams.microsoft.com. On the left hand side, when you scroll down, you will be able to find analytics and reports. So click on usage reports. This is where you would be able to see different types of report. So let's go and explore a few of the different types of reports available. The first one is Teams usage report. This gives you details like active users, active users in Teams and channel, active channel messages, privacy settings for Teams guests in, in a team, etc. Let's explore Teams user activity report. So I'm going to click on one. This is going to give me a report on Teams activity. So I'm going to change the date to last seven days. As you can see that there is not so much information. I'm going to go back to 90 days to see some report within the, within the status. So this report gives you one-on-one -on -one chat a user participated in, messages a user posted in a Teams chat, and messages a user posted in a private chat as well. And you would be able to get details like last activity date of a user as well. Let's explore Teams device usage report. As you can see, I don't have many usage report from other devices like Mac, iOS, Android, Chrome, operating system, Windows Phone or Linux. I only use one device to access Teams, which is Windows. So this gives details like, is it a Windows user, Mac user, iOS user, Android phone user, etc. Let's explore what Teams live event usage is all about. So you can select days, click on run report. I have not run any Teams live event, so I really highlight unlikely to see any report, but this is where you would be able to see total views, start time, even status, organizer, presenter, producer, recording settings, production type, etc. All sort of live event usage report will be visible over here. Then there are other couple of important reports like PSTN block user, PSTN minute and SMS, PSTN and SMS preview reports as well. These reports will give you timestamp user information related to your teams and PSTN uh details etc please note that the teams reports display the data for the users and channels which have been active for example if the user in your organization isn't active in teams during the date range specified for a report data for that user will not be included in that report another functionality is you can download or export this report to a CSV file for offline analysis. So you can select export to Excel or then on the downloads tab, select download to download the report when it's ready. Then there is Microsoft 365 usage report. For that, you have to go to Microsoft 365 Admin Center, click on usage. 
Microsoft 365 Usage Analytics provide you with a better view of how your organization is adopting various services within Microsoft 365. At a glance, Activity Widgets gives you a cross-product view of how users communicate and collaborate using other various services of Microsoft 365. And the Microsoft 365 Usage Analytics content represent a dashboard that provides a cross-product view of last seven days, 30 days, 90 days, and 180 days. This data won't exist for all reporting periods right away. The report becomes available within 48 hours. Now that we have learned about how to access Teams report and Microsoft 365 usage report, Microsoft 365 includes multiple technologies that provide security and user identity protection. There are multiple tools which are built into Microsoft 365 services. So the administrators can choose how to protect the identity of the users using the platform and applications. Identity mode supported in Teams are cloud identity, synchronized identity, and federated identities. In cloud identity, a user is created and managed in Office 365 and stored in Azure Active Directory. And the password is verified by Azure Active Directory. In the synchronized identity model, the user identity is managed in the the user identity is managed in an on-premises server, and the account and password hashes are synchronized to the cloud. The user enters the same password on premises as they do in the cloud. And at the sign in, the password is verifiable by Azure Active Directory. This model uses the Microsoft Azure Active Directory Connect tool. The third one, federated identity. In this model, a synchronized identity with the user password is verified by the on premises identity provider. The password hash does not need to be synchronized to Azure AD and Azure Active Directory Federation Services or AD, ADFS or a third party identity provider is used to authenticate users against the on premises Azure Active Directory. Multi factor authentication. To increase the user's security during the Office 365 sign in process, Microsoft Teams support multi-factor authentication or MFA, which is a two-step verification process. With MFA, the user signing in to the Office 365 account after correctly entering the password is required to choose the second option, such as a phone call, text message, an app notification, on their smartphone in order to verify the login. There are two supported authentication methods which differ from one another by identity model. Cloud only and hybrid setup. In the cloud only model, you can use phone call, text messages, mobile app notification and mobile app verification code. In the hybrid setup, which is a synchronized or federated model offers, these are the following second factor options which is MFA for Office 365, Azure MFA module or ADFS integrated, or physical or virtual smart card, which is again ADFS integrated as well. Modern authentication is a process which provides the Teams application with verification that you have already entered your credentials, your work email and password on some other app in Office 365. There are two options. One is Windows user scenario and Apple Mac user scenario. When you are signed in to other Office 365 apps through your Office 365 Enterprise account and you start Microsoft Teams, you're going to be taken directly to the app. No need to enter the password. If an Apple Mac computer user tries to start Teams, the computer will not be able to use your credentials from your Office 365 Enterprise account or from any other application of Office 365 application. The user will be requested for MFA. Then when the user enters the credentials, he will not request sign in again. At that point, whenever the user is working on the same computer, the Microsoft client will automatically start. 
In order to sign out of Microsoft Teams, the user can click the profile picture, which can be found at the upper right corner of the application. Now that we have learned about the Teams authentication mode, in the next demonstration, we are going to learn about how to configure conditional access and MFA for Microsoft Teams. Organizations are in a constant changing security threat environment. Employees often need to access the company resources as well as communication channels from different locations. Organizations face a challenge when protecting the company data and at the same time providing the employees with access to the workplace resources they need. Conditional access policies apply actions to users who sign into apps from their devices depending on multiple conditions. These conditions might include a user or a group membership, IP location information, device and application real-time risk detection, or Microsoft Cloud App Security information. Conditional access policies that are set for these cloud apps apply to Microsoft Teams. When a user directly signs into Microsoft Teams or any client, Microsoft Team is supported separately as a cloud app in Azure Active Directory conditional access policies. Let me go and show you in the Azure portal where you can apply these settings for your organization. I'm on my Azure portal. On the left-hand side, I'm gonna to go to my Azure Active Directory. Under Azure Active Directory, if you scroll down to security, this is where you can find the conditional access policies. So click on Azure AD conditional access. On the conditional access policies page, you can see there are a few baseline policies available. You can click on new policy to create a new conditional access policy. The name field, I'm gonna type Teams policy. Under users and group, I'm gonna select all users. I have an option to add all guests and external users as well. Under cloud apps is where I'm gonna select Microsoft Teams. Search for Microsoft Teams. And you can select that application. And the condition is this is where you can select what sort of a condition you would like to apply. Devices, location, device state, device platform, etc. Access control is where you will either block or grant access. So I'm going to grant access, but after requiring multi-factor authentication control. And after you select that, you basically can go and turn on the feature or turn off, or you can use report only. That will give you a report based on the user signing it and what response they are getting it. This is how you can set up MFA for Microsoft Teams. Now that we have learned about how to configure conditional access for Microsoft Teams, in this lesson, we're gonna learn about overview of Teams admin roles. As a global administrator, you can access Azure Active Directory and configure additional administrators, which require different levels of access for managing Microsoft Teams. These administrators can manage the entire Teams implementation or you can choose and assign them permissions just for a segment of Microsoft Teams. There are four main types of Teams admin roles available. Let's go and see in detail what are those. The first one is Teams Service Administrator. Teams Service Administrator manage the Teams service, manage and create Microsoft 365 groups. This type of admin can access everything in Microsoft Teams Admin Center and associated PowerShell commands. Where Teams Communications Administrator manage calling and meeting features within the Teams service, including meeting policies, manage meetings, configurations, voice, calling policies, and phone number inventory and assignment. This user can assess, monitor, and troubleshoot tenant call quality and view user's profile page and troubleshoot user call quality problems as well. Teams Communication Support Engineer can troubleshoot communication issues within Teams by using advanced tools, including call analytics and call quality dashboard. 
team's communication support specialist can troubleshoot communications issue within the team by basic tools, including call analytics and call quality dashboards. You can assign team's admin roles by using Azure AD or PowerShell. The global admin role is needed to assign team's admin role to users. Now that we have understood different types of team's admin roles, in this demonstration, I'm going to walk you through how to assign Microsoft Teams admin roles within Microsoft 365 Center and Azure AD portal as well. So like we discussed so far, there are multiple ways you can assign Teams admin roles. You can go to Microsoft 365 Admin Center or Azure portal, or you can assign via PowerShell as well. So let's head back to the Microsoft 365 Admin Center to see how to assign Teams admin role. So I'm in my Microsoft 365 Admin Center. Once you expand users, you can click on Active Users. Basically, what we are trying to find is how to assign a Teams admin role. So I'm going to pick a regular user. And once you select a user, you can go under Roles, select Manage Roles, and you can expand Show by Category. So I'm going to go and enable Admin Center Access. So as you can see here, there is Teams Service Admin Role available over here as well. This will give full access to Teams and other Skype Admin Center. So we want to see other Teams role as well. So if you scroll down towards the bottom, you can see other three roles. So there is Teams Communication Admin, Teams Communication Support Engineer, Teams Communication Support Specialist, and team service admin. You can click on this information button or hover your mouse to see what these role entitles to, what a user can do or cannot do. So that's how you can assign a role in Microsoft 365 Center. Now let's go to the Azure portal and see how you can assign a role in the Azure portal. So I logged into my Azure portal using my global administrator username and password. I go under my Azure AD, under Manage, there are Users. I'm going to pick a user. This time, I'm going to pick Jerry. And right under the profile, there is Assigned Roles. So click on Assigned Role. And on top of the Assigned Role, you can see that there is Add Assignments. And select a role. So I'm going to search for Teams. As you can see that there are four Teams roles available. So I can basically pick up a role if that is what I want to do or assign to this user. I select the role and click next. And basically I can make it available as an eligible role or an active role because I have configured Azure AD privileged identity for this particular account. So that's how you can assign a role for a user under Azure portal as well. So now we have learned about how to assign a Teams admin role for a user. In this demonstration, I'm going to teach you how to implement threat management for Microsoft Teams. So once deployed, Microsoft Teams will become the hub for organizational collaboration, where multiple documents will be shared and accessed. Therefore, you must ensure that all documents that are used and shared within your Microsoft Teams are protected from potential threats, such as malware. Office 365 Advanced Threat Protection helps your organization protect against malicious threat, which may be posted by email messages, links, as well as through your collaboration tools you are using. It includes threat protection policies, reports, threat investigation, and response capabilities as well. To configure and assign ATP policies, you must have one of the following roles. You need to have either Office 365 Global Administrator or Security Administrator. So I am in my Microsoft 365 Admin Center. To access Security Portal, all I have to do is either go to security.microsoft.com or I can click on this admin center. It takes me to security.microsoft.com as well. So once I'm in my security portal, this is a one-stop shop for all sort of security policies. I can define DLP policies, information governance, threat management, search policies, etc. A lot of things I can do over here. 
So what we are after is we are going to select a policy and then select an ATP safe attachment. So I'm going to go under threat management, click on policy. And you can find ATP safe attachment policy over here. So turn on ATP safe attachment policy. And this is where I can turn on ATP for SharePoint, OneDrive and Microsoft Teams. Once I do that, ATP is going to protect all the information within your SharePoint, OneDrive and Teams. Uh, you can create a new policy or you can basically modify an existing policy as well. So how does ATP work? So Office 365 Advanced Threat Protection provide the users within your company with safe environment. So Office 365 Advanced Threat Protection provides the users within your company with a safe environment for collaboration and communication and helps the malicious files to be detected and blocked in team site and document libraries. If a document that is stored in Microsoft Teams, SharePoint Online and OneDrive for Business has been identified as malicious, ATP directly work with the file stores to lock that files. Even though the user can still see the blocked file in the document library and web, mobile and desktop application, it cannot be opened, copied, moved or shared. However, the malicious files can be deleted. Now that we have learned about how the ATP work and how to implement ATP, in this demonstration, I'm going to teach you how to access security reports and alerts for Microsoft Teams. Microsoft 365 Security Center provides report that allow you to monitor potential security threats in your organization. Even though threat security reports may not be directly related to Microsoft Teams, they might alert you to suspicious activity that is threatening security for your organization. Microsoft 365 Security Center contains a dashboard that displays reports from different sources, including following categories, identities, data, devices, and apps. Let's closely look at all of this in detail. This category of reports provide data from Azure AD Risky Users Report and Global Azure AD Admin Roles. Reports are related to Microsoft Teams because of sign-in activity to Microsoft Teams from different types of devices. Data category of reports provide data from multiple sources, such as users with the most shared files, DLP policy matches, false positive and overrides. Reports are related to Teams because of data shared and accessed by Teams users. Under Devices category, these reports provide data from Microsoft in tune on devices at risk, device threat analytics, device compliance, malware on devices, and users with malware detection. Reports are related to Microsoft Teams because of large number of mobile devices where Teams is installed. Under Apps category of reports provide data from cloud app security on threats from different apps, such as privileged or auth apps, suspicious admin activity, impersonations and cloud activity geographical locations. Reports are related to Microsoft Teams because of different apps that are integrated with Teams. Let's go and view a few of these reports. I am in Microsoft Security and Compliance Portal. You can access this portal by going into protection.office.com. To access this report, you can go right at the bottom of the left-hand corner, click on Reports, and then select Dashboard. You won't see much data on my portal, but right under Threat Protection Status Report, this is this is where you can get a single view about malicious content and malicious email detected and blocked by Exchange Online Protection. This report can display detection up to 90 days. Explorer is a near real-time tool used to investigate and respond to threats in Office 365. Explorer displays information about suspected malware 
They had fish in emails and files in Office 365, as well as other security threats and risks to your organization. And security admins can create alert policies that will inform them when a shared document in SharePoint Online, OneDrive for Business, or Microsoft Teams has been identified as malicious. To create an alert, you can perform these following settings from here. On the Create Alert Settings page, choose the alert activity, for example, Detection Malware in File. And you can choose the thresholds, for example, every time an activity matches to the rule. And you can set your recipients in the next page as well. That's how you set up reports and alerts for Microsoft Teams in Microsoft 365 Admin Center. In the next lesson, we're going to learn about labels. In today's modern workplace, most organizations use email, chat services, collaboration tools, storage platforms to share information and documentation inside and outside the organization. This makes the data no longer located behind a perimeter firewall. It flows everywhere, across devices, apps, and services. Microsoft 365 addresses these challenges with sensitivity and retention labels. Let's look at sensitivity label and retention label in detail. Sensitivity labels can help the users to classify documents and protect sensitivity content in their files. These sensitivity labels are based on Rights Management Services or RMS, which is available in Azure RMS and on-premises AD RMS. These sensitivity labels are used to classify and protect documents with encryption and central management capabilities to monitor access and even revoke access to documents. Sensitivity labels can be applied manually by end users or automatically based on search patterns. In short, sensitivity labels protect the content of the document even if the storage on which the data is saved is open for collaboration even with external participants. So what is retention label? In some organizational working environment, files contain data which need different action. For example, you might store invoices that you need to retain for a certain period. In this case, retention policies in Office 365 are used in order to make a classification and enforce the content to be automatically deleted or preserved after a certain period. So unified labeling describes the centralized management of labels that can have retention and sensitivity settings applied. Please note that any item can have both a sensitivity label and a ret retention label applied. Now that we have learned on a high level what is sensitivity label and retention label, in this lesson, we're gonna learn about how to create and manage sensitivity labels. You can create and manage both sensitivity and retention labels in Microsoft Office 365 Security and Compliance Center. You can find that under classification. Don't worry, I will take you to the exact place where you can configure that in the later part. Microsoft 365 Compliance Center, which includes information protection, records management, and information governance, and all are part of Microsoft 365 Security Center. When creating labels in a productive environment, you should consider these high-level steps. Things like define the label. You need to pick a fitting name that describes its purpose, then define what each label can do. Things such as information, protection, retention, or deletion. And you would have to define who gets these labels, like which departments, project teams, or single user. After creating and configuring labels, you need to publish them to make them available to people in your organization. And these labels can be applied manually or it can be applied automatically as well. Automatic labeling is a feature that require Azure Information Protection or AIP Plan 2 licenses. Now I'm logged into my Microsoft 365 Admin Center. I have to go to Microsoft 365 Compliance Center. So I'm gonna Go to different portal, which is right under Admin Center. You can directly go by going to compliance.microsoft.com. 
So sensitivity labels can be created under information prediction, which can be found under solutions. So go to information prediction. As you can see that there are a few labels created already. If you want to create a new one, click on create a new label. Provide a name, description. You have, you have an option to turn on the encryption or remove. So I'm going to select that. I'm going to keep it as none. Content marking is where you can set up the headers, footers, watermark content with the label. So you can add a watermark, a header and a footer. And then if you would like to customize what the watermark text, this is where you would be able to add those details. Again, if you look at it, you can change the color, the font size and the way it is displayed on the document as well. This activates automatic classification with labels. This is where you can apply some conditions. So when the content matches these conditions, label will be applied automatically. Next, and this is how you create a label. So this is how you create an information protection classification label. The next one is how to create a retention label. So to create a retention label, we have to go under solutions. This time, this is placed under records management. So click on records management. Under records management, you can go to file plan. As you can see, there are a few file plans labels created already. Create a new retention label, give it a name. This is where you can give details like file plan descriptors. Reference ID is a unique ID for further processing and documentation. Which business function or department are these documents referred to? Which category do these documents fit into? Which types of requirement is met with this label? Which regulatory requirement is this label referred to? So once you provide these details, click next. This is where you would be able to turn on, which activates retention for label documents. When this label is applied to the content, you would be able to add details like, how long would you like to keep this retention for? Would you like to delete this content automatically or do nothing? Or do you want to retain this content, etc. So all of this, policy changes can be made. All of these policy changes can be made over here. And finally, you can, re you can review the details and click on create a retention label. Now that we have created a classification label and a retention label, let's go and find out how to assign labels to these label policies. So for that, I'm going to go back under solutions. This time, I'm going to go back to information protection. Go under label policies. This is where I will be able to see all the policies available. Let's pick one of these policy and you can click on. You can either edit the policy and view the details of the policy. This time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the policy. I'm going to select publish labels and I can choose which label I want to select from. I'm going to select the sample one which we created. Click add, done, next. And you can select where would we, where would you like to apply. So I can choose like all location or I can go back and choose a specific app. I can remove a particular Microsoft 365 service or I can make changes to the sites or recipients or accounts, etc. All of these changes can be done over here. You can name the policy, give the description and review the policy before applying it, read it, and it, it will take up to one day for label to appear to the users. So don't expect this label to be published and take effect immediately. And once you complete it, you can click on publish labels. Similarly, for the retention label, I'm going to go back to record management, go under label policies, click on publish labels. And this is where you can find the label you just created for the retention label. The process is pretty similar. Click next. You can choose a location or 
you can select all Microsoft 365 services and review the policy and hit on publish labels. This is how you create a classification label and a retention label. And then once you have these labels, create a policy and publish it. Now that we have learned about how to create and manage sensitivity labels and retention policy, in this lesson, we're going to learn about how to create and manage DLP policies. Many organizations today are concerned with protection of sensitive information and being compliant with their internal business standards. When we mention sensitive data, we mean the information which can include financial data or personally or PII or personally identifiable information such as credit card numbers, social security numbers and health records. With data loss prevention policies, organizations can identify monitor and automatically protect sensitive information across the Office 365 environment, including Microsoft Teams. So some of the benefits of DLP is listed down over here. So for most organizations which have the DLP for Teams license, policies can be configured that prevent people from sharing sensitive information in a Microsoft Teams channel or chat session. With these policies, the admin can protect sensitive information in messages, sensitive information in documents as well. So when you create and apply the DLP policy, there is an action taken in Microsoft Teams which conflicts with that policy. The user will get policy tip as shown in this particular image. So let's go and see where you can create a DLP policy for Teams. I'm on my Microsoft 365 Admin Center. Go to Compliance Center. Right under solutions, you can find data loss prevention. So within data loss prevention, what we're going to do is we're going to create a new policy. So we can either pick an existing policy for financial, medical health, privacy, custom, etc. So I'm going to go with a custom policy. Click next. I'm going to leave it as custom policy. Here you go. You can see that this cuts across multiple Microsoft 365 solutions including Exchange, SharePoint, OneDrive, devices, etc. And you can turn on for Teams chat and channel messages as well. This is where you can review and create and customize and advance DLP rules. And to create a new rule, give a name for the rule. As you can see, there are conditions, exceptions, actions, user notification. So you would be able to go through each of this based on your requirement. I can add Australia pass passport number as a condition. If you would like to accept anything, you would be able to add that over here. What sort of an action do you want to perform? Would you like to restrict access or do you want to get notification on audit or restrict activities on Windows devices? So if you would like to audit and restrict access, this is where you can modify these in detail. You can further go ahead, go ahead and add more conditions as well. If you like to use notifications to inform users, you can help them educate them on proper use of sensitive info. This is where you can configure that. How, do, how would you like to notify them? Email or policy tips? You can mention the policy, you can mention the policy tip over here. Then we have overrides and some additional options like priority, etc. Once you create your policy, click next, and you have options to test it, which shows the policy tip in the test mode, or you can turn on right away, or keep it off and turn on later. So click next and submit. This is how you would create a DLP policy for Microsoft Teams. Please note that DLP policies can contain Teams and non-Teams location at the same time. In this lesson, we're going to learn about creating and managing a e-discovery case. Organizations have many reasons to respond to legal cases involving certain executives or other employees in their organization. This might involve quickly finding and retaining for further investigation specific information in email, documents, instant messaging, conversation, and other content location used by people in their day-to-day -day work task. These are the three types of e-discoveries available. Content searches, 
e-discovery cases and advanced e-discovery cases. Content searches to perform fast searches for contents saved in one of the Office 365 services. E-discovery cases to add holes and perform content searches in an organized case management structure. And advanced e-discovery cases to analyze large set of unstructured data that needs additional automation through relevance recognition. Let's go and find out how to create a new e-discovery case. I'm on my Microsoft 365 Admin Center. Under Admin Center, go to Security. You can directly go to Security by going into protection.office.com. Once you are in the Security and Compliance Center, scroll down on the left-hand side, you can find e-discovery. So click on e-discovery. This is where you would be able to find any existing case. You can click on open an existing case or you can click and create a new case as well. Advanced topics related to e-discovery is not related to this examination, but I will happily take you through this e-discovery process when we go through MS 500. Now that we have learned about what is e-discovery and how to create a new e-discovery case, in this lesson, we're going to go through a demonstration to find out how to create and manage a supervision policy. For many compliance requirements, you may need to take samples from user communication to see if they comply with all policies and regulations. Because e-discovery is an inadequate tool for taking random samples, you can use supervision policies to analyze only a certain amount of data from supervised users and groups. You can define policies that capture internal and external email, Microsoft Teams, or third-party communication. Reviewers can then examine the messages to make sure that they are compliant with your organization's message standards and resolve them with a classification type. Some of the supported communication types of supervision policies include Exchange Email, Microsoft Teams, Skype for Business Online, and third-party sources. So let's look at the licensing requirement for supervision policy. Supervision policy is an advanced compliance feature and all users in scope of supervision policies need one of the following licenses options. Microsoft 365 E5 compliance, Office 365 E3 with an advanced compliance add-on or Office 365 E5. I'm on my Microsoft 365 Admin Center. Right under Admin Center, I can go to Security. Under Security and Compliance Portal, click on Permissions and scroll down to find Supervisor Review or you can search for that as well. So this is where you can go and see the members of this group. I'm going to edit the membership and I'm going to choose a member and add a user. So let's go to the Supervision. So I don't have much data over here, but this is where you can create a new supervision policy. And please note that when adding groups to supervised users, dynamic distribution groups are not supported. On choosing reviewers, either distribution group or dynamic distribution groups are supported. Now that we have learned about supervision policy, in this lesson, we're gonna learn about use scoped discovery search. With Microsoft Teams scoped discovery search, the administrator can create virtual boundaries that control how users communicate with each other within the organization. Microsoft Teams provide custom views of this discovery to the company users. Once the policy has been enabled, the results returned by searches for other users will be scoped according to the configured policies. User will not be able to search or discover themes when scope search is in an effect. Note that in case of exchange hybrid environments, this feature will not work. Note that in case of exchange hybrid environment, this feature will only work with exchange online mailboxes, not with on-prem mailboxes. So when should you use scope discovery searches? You may use the scope discovery searches when your organization has multiple companies within a single tenant and you want to segment searches by companies or you would like to limit chat with, between faculty and students or different departments. So let's go and find out how to turn on scope discovery search. To turn on scope discovery search, you need to do it in Teams Admin Center. 
So I'm going to go to Teams Admin Center. So under Org Wide Settings, select Team Settings. Scroll down till you find Search by Name. So when you turn this on, this is how you will turn on Scope Discovery Search using an Exchange using an Exchange Address Book Policy. You need to wait at least 24 hours after enabling Scope Discovery Search before you can set up or define information barrier policies. Now that we have learned about what is Scope Discovery Search and how to turn on Scope Discovery Search, in this lesson, we're going to talk about managing GDPR data subject request. Personal data is defined in detail under the GDPR or General Data Protection Regulation. It refers to any data which relates to an identified or identifiable natural person that is a resident of a European Union. The GDPR defines the rights and restrictions on how to manage the personal data that has been collected by an employer or other organization. Office 365 administrative tools have implemented features which can assist in searching and finding as well as acting on personal data in order to respond to data subject requests or DSR. To manage investigations in response to a DSR submitted by a person, you can use DSR case tool in Security and Compliance Center to find the content stored in any user mailbox, any mailbox associated with Microsoft 365 Group, all SharePoint online sites, all Teams and Microsoft 365 Groups, and all public folders in Exchange Online as well. Please note that the DSR case tool is based on e-discovery, but modified to find personal data of users. So let's go and find out how to create a DSR case. So I am on my Microsoft 365 Admin Center. I'm going to Security and Compliance Center. You can directly go to the portal by going into portal.office.com. To create a data subject request, we need to navigate to data privacy. Under data privacy, click on data subject request. You can see that there is one data subject request case created already. To open it, I just need to click on just open or you can click on new DSR case to open a new case as well. Now that we have learned about what is GDPR and how to create a DSR case, in this lesson, we're going to learn about information barrier policy. Information barrier policies are created when an administrator wants to restrict the communication between certain individuals or groups. For example, an R&D department is working on highly confidential projects which are not allowed to share with people outside the organization. For example, an R&D department is working on a highly confidential project which are not allowed to share with people outside the department. The administrator needs to prevent or isolate people in R&D department from communicating with anyone outside of that group. An information barrier can prevent the following type of communication between user in teams. Searching for a user, adding a member to the team, starting a chat with someone, starting a group chat, inviting someone to group inviting someone to join a meeting, sharing a screen or placing a call. Please note that information barriers require the scope directory search in Teams. If you didn't activate it already, you need to activate it and wait for 24 hours to use this feature. Information barrier is an advanced compliance feature and require some licenses. This feature is available for users with Microsoft 365 E5 Office 365 E5, Office 365 Advanced Compliance, and Microsoft 365 E5 Information Protection and Compliance License Holders. There are three main phases to define policies for information barrier. The first part is to segment users in your organization. This will ensure you to comply with the regulatory requirements. You need to plan which users are allowed to communicate and which are not allowed to do so. Part two, is defining the information barrier policies. After creating segments, you can create the policies that restrict the segments from communication. Remember that any policy restricts only one way and if you want to restrict the communication between two segments, 
you need at least two policies. Then part three is apply information barrier policies. After creating segments and policies for communication, the information barrier policy still needs to be applied. Now that we have learned on a high level, what is information barrier policy all about? In this lesson, we're going to learn about security and compliance alert for Microsoft Teams. Alert policies help administrators identify events in their tenants that could indicate a security breach, an abuse of administrative privileges, or other activities that require monitoring. Alert policies send email notification and track recognized events on an alert dashboard in Security and Compliance Center to keep track of events in a tenant. So how does the alert policy work? This following diagram shows the basic workflow of how a alert policy work. Administrators create new or modify existing policies in Security and Compliance Center. The user or administrator performs actions which match the conditions that trigger the alert policy. An alert is generated and the according alert action is triggered, such as sending an email to a global administrator, etc. Finally, administrators review alerts in alerts dashboard and decide to acknowledge or dismiss the alert. Please note that there are currently up to 22 default alert policies available. An alert policy consists of a set of rules and conditions that define the user or admin activity that generates an alert, a list of users who are in scope of triggering the alert if they perform the activity, a threshold that defines how many times the activity may occur before an alert is triggered. All of these alerts are categorized into one of these six categories, which helps with tracking and managing the alerts generated by a policy. You can assign one of the following categories to a policy. That's a quick high level overview on create security and compliance alerts. In this lesson, we're going to evaluate upgrade path with coexistence and upgrade modes. When you are upgrading from Sky for Business to Microsoft Teams, either online or on premises, there are only two approaches, direct upgrade journey or gradual upgrade journey. In direct upgrade journey, you first deploy teams alongside Sky for Business in islands mode as part of evaluation. The goal is to quickly retire Sky for Business from environment for all users in the organization. It is the recommended journey for Sky for Business online customers. In direct upgrade journey, teams are deployed to all users in the organization and configured in islands mode. You can see the direct upgrade journey illustrated in this diagram. In case your organization is currently a Sky for Business on-premises deployment only, you need to start planning to implement Sky for Business hybrid before upgrading your users to Teams only mode. A gradual upgrade journey offers coexistence and individual upgrade modes for different groups of users, also called cohorts. In this path, Teams is deployed for the organization in islands mode for evaluation and then move on to the different coexistence mode for different groups of users. You can see the gradual upgrade journey illustrated in this following diagram. Now that we have learned about the two upgrade journeys, direct and gradual, in this lesson, we're going to learn about manage meeting migration. Meeting migration service provides updates for existing meetings when a user is migrated from on-prem to the cloud, when an admin makes a change to a user's audio conferencing settings, when an online user is upgraded to Teams only, when you use PowerShell to trigger MMS as well. In each one of these cases, the MMS is automatically triggered. When meeting migration service has been triggered for a user, a migration request for that user is placed in a queue. Once the MMS processes this request, it will perform these tasks. Tasks such as it searches user's mailbox for all existing and future meetings organized by that user. It updates or schedules new meetings in either Teams or Skype for Business Online. In the email message, it replays 
the online meeting block in the meeting detail, it sends the updated version of that meeting to all meeting recipients on behalf of the meeting organizer. Please note that if an error occurs during the migration process, MMS will periodically retry up to nine times during the 24 hours. When the MMS is triggered for a user, there are a few things we need to understand. The user is migrated from on-premises to the cloud. Admin makes a change to the user audio conferencing settings. Upgrading meetings when assigning teams upgrade policy and admin uses the PowerShell commands. Now that we have learned on a high level what is MMS and what kind of offers MMS provides, in this lesson, we're going to learn about how to configure coexistence and upgrade settings for Microsoft Teams. When planning your transition from Skype for Business to Teams, you will need to choose appropriate upgrade path and coexistent modes for a smooth transition to Microsoft Teams in your organization. You can choose the same coexistence mode for all users and upgrade to Microsoft Teams all at once. Or you may need to do the migration batch by batch, configuring different coexistent modes for different groups of users. Let's go and explore how to upgrade options for all users from Teams Admin Center. I signed into my Teams Admin Center. You can go directly to Teams Admin Center by going into admin.teams.microsoft.com. Once you are at the portal, Click on org wide settings and select Teams Upgrade. This is the page where you will have option to upgrade to Island, Skype for Business, Skype for Business with Teams Collaboration, Skype for Business with Teams Collaboration and Meeting and Teams Only mode. Since my tenant is a brand new cloud only subscription, I'm not able to see that. So if I go back to my presentation, ideally if you are in a coexistent environment, you will see these options. Basically, when you go to the coexistence mode, you would be able to choose between these different modes. So that's how you set up your coexistence and upgrade settings for Teams. In this lesson, we're going to learn about Teams networking requirements. Microsoft Teams utilizes three types of network traffic directions. Data traffic between the Office 365 online environment and the Teams client. Peer-to-peer real-time communication traffic. Conferencing real-time communication traffic. This impacts the network data flow in two levels. The traffic flow between the Teams client directly in peer-to-peer -peer situations and between the Office 365 environment and the Teams clients for meetings. Therefore, to ensure optimal traffic flow, Traffic must be allowed to flow between the internal network segments, such as between sites over the wide area network, as well as between the network sites and Office 365. Not opening the correct ports or actively blocking specific ports will lead to a degraded experience. When analyzing the existing network capabilities, consider the following areas in your network access. When analyzing existing network capabilities, you need to consider things like connectivity to your Office 365, quality of your network connectivity, available bandwidth, clients connected over wireless, NAT pool size, network health determination, VPN, Wi-Fi, proxy servers, etc. When evaluating the existing network environment, hard limitations such as blocked IP addresses, Faulty name resolution through DNS and block ports are fast to support because certain Teams features will simply not work all when IP address or ports are closed. Discovering bandwidth, latency, or packet loss issues is more complicated because they may appear only under special circumstances. For example, if a high number of users are using voice communication at the same time, Therefore, when planning the network requirements for Teams deployment, you must calculate the maximum number of concurrent users, including a reasonable buffer. This following table shows the recommended network capabilities in package transmission quality. Network Planner is a tool in Teams Admin Center, which is designed to assist the admin to determine and organize network requirements for connecting Microsoft Teams users across the whole organization. 
You can access the tool by going to Microsoft Teams Admin Center under Planning, then select Network Planner. After providing the network details and Teams usage, Network Planner calculates the network requirements for deploying Teams and Cloud Voice across the organizational physical locations. With the Network Planner, you can create representations for your organizations using Site and Microsoft rep recommended personas, generate reports and calculate bandwidth requirements for Teams usage. In order to use the Network Planner, you must have one of the following roles. You have to be either Global Administrator, Teams Admin, or Teams Communication Administrator. The Network Testing Companion provides results for exporting and sharing with other network administrators or partners. The Companion also helps discover potential issues related to the organization's network and connectivity to Teams. This tool can also be used during the assessment and planning process of Microsoft Teams deployment. If you are using Teams now, you can also use this tool to troubleshoot voice quality issues or analyze the network connection before users make, make a call. For Teams to function correctly, you must open TCP port 80 and 443 and UDP port 3478 through 3481. The TCP ports are used to connect to web-based content such as SharePoint Online, Exchange Online, and Teams chat services. Plugins and connectors also connect over these TCP ports. The four UDP ports are used for media such as audio and video to ensure they flow correctly. The report labels and locations data you provide is a single data structure. To configure the table of subnets and location, you need to go under locations and reporting labels and upload the locations data. Please note, a productive data file should not contain column headers, example, network, network name, etc. Quality of service, or QoS, is a mechanism you use to prioritize certain types of network traffic. QoS is a way to allow real-time network traffic, like voice or video streams, that is sensitive to network delays to cut in line ahead of traffic that is less sensitive, like downloading a new app where an extra second to download is negligible. QoS identifies and marks all packets in real-time streams using Windows Group Policy objects and a routing feature called Port-Based Access Control List. In most cases, the implementation of QoS is considered either during the planning and assessment phase or during the deployment of Microsoft Teams voice communication. Now that we have learned about Teams networking requirement, in this lesson, we're going to learn about deploy Microsoft Teams clients to devices. The desktop client is available for the following operating systems, Windows 8.1 or later, or Windows Server 2012 R2 or later, 32-bit and 64-bit versions, Mac operating system 10.10 .10 or later, Linux .deb and .rpm formats. Virtual Desktop Infrastructure, or VDI, is virtualization technology that hosts a desktop operating system and application on a centralized server in a data center. By using VDI, the users can enjoy a full personalized desktop experience with a fully secured and compliant centralized source. Using Teams in a virtualized environment may be somewhat different from using Teams on a non-virtualized environment. It is recommended that you consult your virtualization solution provider to ensure the minimum requirements are met. You can deploy the Teams desktop app for VDI using a per machine installation or per user installation using an MSI package. The Teams mobile app are available for Android and iOS. In order to download the mobile app, users can go to their mobile app store via Google Play or Apple App Store. There are two supported mobile platforms for Microsoft Teams and mobile apps. Android support is limited to the last four major versions of Android. iOS support is limited to the two most recent major versions of iOS. The Teams web client is available for a variety of different browsers, including Edge, Chrome, and Safari. 
the web client performs browser version detection upon connecting to teams.microsoft.com. If an unsupported browser version is detected, it will block access to the web interface and recommend that the user download a desktop client or mobile app. Now that we have learned about the different types of Teams client options, in this lesson, we're going to learn about how to manage device settings and firmware. Managing devices is performed with Microsoft Teams Admin Center. After you sign in to the Teams Admin Portal, select Devices and select Phones. This is where you can find all the devices. As you can see that I don't have any devices. But if you have devices, this is where you will manage all the devices enrolled in Teams within your organization. Some of the management tasks you can perform in Teams are listed here. You can change device information. You would be able to manage software update, restart a device, view a device history, and view diagnostics as well. Now that we have learned about how to manage devices, in this lesson, we're going to learn about manage configuration profiles. To manage settings and features for Teams devices in your organization, you can use configuration profiles. As an administrator, you can create or upload configuration profiles to include settings and features which you would like to enable or disable and then assign your profile to a group or devices of your choice. Let's go and explore how to do this. I'm in my Teams admin portal. Under devices, I'm going to go to phones. Within the phones page, you can select the configuration profiles and you would be able to add a name to the profile and you can go through all the settings available within the profile page. Under device settings, you would be able to choose or enable display screensaver, brightness, backlight, contrast, silent mode, office hours, power saving, and screen capture. Under network settings, you will be able to enable DHCP, login, or you can configure hostname, domain name, IP address, subnet mask, network PC port, etc. Once you complete, you can hit on save. Once the configuration policy have been created, you will need to assign them to an appropriate device. To assign a configuration profile, you can go to the Teams Admin Center. On the phones page, select the configuration profile and you can assign to a device. In this case, I don't have any device within my subscription, but this is how will you but this is how you will create a profile and assign to a device. Now that we have learned about how to manage and configure the profiles, in this lesson, we're going to learn about how to configure Microsoft Teams rooms. Microsoft Teams Rooms provide a complete meeting experience that brings HD video, audio, and content sharing to meeting of all sizes, from small huddle areas to large conference rooms. Microsoft Teams Room system can be purchased in several configurations, bundled as a system with separate components or as an integrated unit as well. When you want to deploy Microsoft Teams Room in your organization, you must go through a detailed planning phase, including evaluating, testing, to find the best fitting conference experience for your users. The following diagram shows the common required steps to prepare, deploy, and maintain Microsoft Teams Room in your organization. Configuration and deployment of Microsoft Teams Rooms include following steps. Starts with account provisioning, then device software installation, device deployment, Microsoft Teams Room application and peripheral device configuration, testing, and asset management. So now that we have learned on a high level what Microsoft Meeting Rooms are or Microsoft Teams Rooms, in this demo walkthrough, we're going to learn how to create and manage Teams. By default, all users can create Teams using the Teams client and invite members unless you restrict the creation of Teams to global administrators or team service administrators. Administrators can also create teams in the Teams Admin Center or PowerShell. There are multiple ways you can create teams, either by going to Teams Admin Center, Teams Client, or PowerShell or Graph API. 
So let me take you to the Teams admin center and show you how to create Teams there. So I am on my Microsoft Teams admin center. Under Teams, you can click on Manage Teams. This is where you would be able to see all the teams within your Teams environment. To create a new Teams, click on Add, give a name to the team, description. You can set a Teams owner, define what type of team it is. Is it a public or private team? And you can select a classification if you have set a classification already. And then hit Apply. That will simply go ahead and create a Teams. Now let me go and show you how to create a Teams on the Teams client app. So now I am on my Teams client app. As you can see that the sample team I just created is already turned up here. To create a new Teams, click on Join or Create a Team. Click on Create Team. Two options, build a team from scratch or create from an Office 365 group. So we're gonna build a team from scratch. We have three options here, a private, public and org wide. The org wide group, when you create it, everyone within your organization will be automatically joined. So let's click create that. And I'm going to leave the name like that and hit on create. So now this is creating an org wide team. If I go and look within the team, you can see that there are 18 members already part of this group. That's because this is an org wide team. So please note that whenever you create a team, it is best practice to configure at least two owners for self-service needs for the team. If a group owner leaves your company, the group could be fined itself without an owner. The content in the group is unaffected by this, but not having a group owner means that there is nobody with permission to manage the group. Anytime, the single owner is not available and modifications of the teams are not required, the members will have to contact the team's administrator. This problem can be resolved by any administrator within your organization. Teams templates are pre-built definition of a team structure designed around a business need or project. You can use teams template to quickly create rich collaboration spaces with channels for different topics and pre-install apps to pull a mission critical content and services. Teams templates provide a predefined team structure that can help you easily create consistent team across your organization. Some of the capabilities of Teams templates are, you, you would be able to define a team name, description, visibility, auto favorite channel, installed app, pin tabs, team membership, etc. There are two ways to create teams from the template. Use an existing team as a template or create a team from base template. And then there are several options to create a team from an existing resource. You can upgrade a SharePoint team site or a Microsoft 365 group to a team directly. You also can convert a distribution list to a Microsoft 365 group. Then you can convert it to a team with this intermediate step. This also works if a group was created as part of a plan in Planner. Remember, when creating a team, the underlying group cannot have more than 5,000 members. And we have seen an example just before on how to create an org-wide team. An org-wide team provides an automatic way for everyone in a small or medium-sized environment to be part of a single team for collaborations or announcement. As an admin, you may need to view or update the teams that your organization set up for collaboration. Or you might need to perform remediation actions such as assigning orders or orderless teams. You can manage the teams used in your organization using either the Microsoft Teams Admin Center or Microsoft Teams PowerShell module as well. These channels are dedicated sections within the team to keep conversations organized by specific topic, projects, disciplines, etc. Each channel could be different unit in a department or a project group in a larger group within a different group. Before you create channel, you first need to decide which channel you need and if they shall be standard or private. 
You can create a channel by going into a team and click on add a channel, give a name for your channel and within the privacy, you have two options, standard and private. At some point when managing teams, it will become necessary to retain or delete teams that are no longer actively used. You can archive or delete teams. Both options stop users from modifying teams content and using that team for further collaboration. Policy packages in Microsoft Teams let you control Teams features that you want to allow or restrict for a specific set of people across your organization. These policy packages simply streamline and help provide consistency when managing policies for group of users across your organization. View the settings of each policy in a policy package before you assign a package. Make sure that you understand each settings and then decide whether the predefined values are appropriate for your organization or whether you need to change them to be more restrictive or lenient based on your organization's need. In this lesson, we're going to learn how to manage membership in Teams. Within Microsoft Teams, there are two user roles, owner and member. By default, a user who creates a team is granted the owner access or the owner status. And owners can promote other members to become additional owners. Owners can add members to their team. If the team is public, then members are also allowed to add members to the team. In private team, members can request additional new members to the team. The owners will be informed of the request and they can act accordingly. Please note that owners can make other members as owners in the view teams option. A team can have up to 100 owners. It's recommended that you have at least a few owners to help manage the team. This will also prevent orphan groups if a sole owner leaves your organization. Let's go to the Teams Admin Center and find out how to manage users in Team using Teams Admin Center. So I'm inside the Teams Admin Center. I'm going to go under Teams and click on Manage Teams. This is where I will be able to select a team and manage Teams membership. So I clicked or selected a team. I can see that who is the member of the team and who are the owners and who are the members. I can simply click on a user and I can make that member an owner as well. As long as I logged in as a global administrator and have access to that particular teams as an owner rights. So I logged in as this user called Rick and Rick is the owner of that particular group. Microsoft Teams support dynamic membership of team members by leveraging the dynamic membership feature in Azure Active Directory. Dynamic membership enables you to define members of a team by one or more rules that check for certain user attributes in Azure Active Directory. Users are automatically removed or added to the designated team as user attribute change or user joins or leave the tenant. With dynamic membership, you can set up teams for certain cohorts of users in your organization. Let's go and find out how to turn on dynamic membership in the Azure portal. I'm in my Azure portal. Let's go to Azure Active Directory. On the left hand side under Manage, you can click on Groups. Under Groups, you can see there are many groups available. So let's select a dynamic group, for example. It's called Enroll Devices. If I go to Properties, this is where you would be able to see what type of group it is. As you can see that it's a dynamic device group. Similarly, let's find out a dynamic user group. I'm going to select an existing group, go to properties and change the assign type to assign to dynamic user. And this is where you can add a dynamic user member query. In this query page, this is where you can add configuration rule or validate rules. You can add expressions to find out how you would like to add an operator to select the value to add a particular user to this group. Once you provide the value and save it based on the syntax what you provide, the query is going to fetch all the users existing within your tenant 
or any time a new user joins your tenant based on the attribute that user can be automatically part of the group as well. Azure Active Directory access reviews enable organizations to efficiently manage group membership without needing administrative oversight. You can create access reviews for different types of scenarios. You can use access reviews for owners to evaluate team members and guests or for members and guests to review if they still need access for teams they are a member of. Let's go to the Azure portal and see how it has been done. I'm in my Azure portal. Let's go to Azure Active Directory. Under Manage, you would be able to find something called Identity Governance. Let's go to Identity Governance and under Settings or Access Reviews, you can click on Access Reviews. Right now, I don't have any Access Reviews. You can simply create a new Access Review by click on New Access Review, give a name, provide a description, the start and end date and the frequency where you would like to activate the review. Once you create this Access Review, you can apply to a group and you can enable the group owners and the program which you want to apply this access review to. Now that we have learned about different types of membership management and access review, in this lesson, we're going to learn how to manage access for external users. There are two ways to collaborate and communicate with people outside of your organization when using Teams. You can add them as guest user in your tenant or you can enable external access. So let's learn What's the main difference between external access versus guest access? You use external access when you have users in different domain in your business. You want the people in your organization to use Teams to contact people in specific businesses outside of your organization. And you use external access when you want anyone else in the world who uses Teams to be able to find and contact you using your email addresses. External access allow external users to find, call, and send you instant messages as well as set up meetings with you. So what is guest access? A team owner in Microsoft can add and manage guests in their teams via the web, mobile, or desktop clients. Anyone with a business or consumer email account such as Outlook, Gmail, and others can participate as a guest in Teams. People outside of your organization, such as partners or consultants, can be added as guests and people from within your organization can join as regular team members. Some of the functionalities are not available for guest users. Services such as OneDrive for Business, Calendar, Schedule Meetings and Meeting Details, PSTN Calling, organizational charts, etc. External users are guest users that get invited to collaborate inside your tenant. This differs from users you can communicate with using external access. In Azure Active Directory, guest access in Microsoft Teams relies on Azure AD business to business platform. This authorization level controls the guest experience at the directory, tenant and application level. Microsoft Teams group control the guest experience in Microsoft 365 groups and Microsoft Teams. SharePoint Online and OneDrive for Business controls the guest experience in SharePoint Online and OneDrive for Business. And Microsoft Teams controls the guest experience in Microsoft Teams only. Because guest invitations create guest object in your Azure AD tenant, the external collaboration settings in Azure AD are the most restrictive and control the guest experience for the tenant and all applications. Let's go and explore how to configure those settings in Azure portal. I'm in my Azure portal. To configure the guest access, we need to go to Azure Active Directory. Under Manage, you can find Users. Under Users, you can find User Settings. Just scroll down till you find External Users. So click on Manage External Collaboration Settings. This is where you will find all the options where you can turn on and turn off to allow or not allow guest users permission to your tenant. You can enable this external access for organization in your Teams admin portal as well. Let's go and find out how to do that. I am in my Teams admin portal. I'm on my Microsoft Teams admin center. 
On the left hand side, you can find all the wide settings. And under that, you can find external access and guest access. So this is where you can turn on to allow an external user access and you can add a domain. And for the guest users, you can turn on or turn off and you can decide which services you would like to add and allow these guest users to access from your tenant. That concludes module four. In this lesson, we're gonna learn about how to manage messaging policies. Messaging policies are used to control chat and channel messaging features for users. They can provide and deny messaging actions for users, such as the possibility to delete send message, stickers, giffies, or the ability of users to remove other users from the group chat. All users are assigned to the global policy by default. Additional custom policies can be created and assigned to individual users, but any, users, but any user can only be assigned to one messaging policy at a time. Messaging policies are managed from Teams Admin Center. On the left hand side, you can see the messaging policies. I can go and view or modify the existing global org wide default policy. And this is where you can see all the policy options available. So the first option will give an ability to control whether owners can delete messages sent by other, other users. And similarly, there are plenty of policies which enable owners to edit message. Would you like to read receipts by a user control or do you want to turn off for everyone? If you don't want to use Giphy's in composition, you can turn this on. It's an again, this again is an org wide setting. So it applies to the whole tenant. Then there are policies like removing user from group chats, suggested replies, etc. You can click on the information button to see more information related to the policy. Click on learn more. This takes you to the Microsoft documentation, which gives you plenty of explanation on what this policy is all about. Similarly, you would be able to create a new policy for a new set of users. All you have to do is go to add and create a new policy and you can modify it and apply. Once you have multiple policies, you can group them and you can rank these policies as well. Now that we have learned about Teams messaging policies, in this demo, we're gonna go through and learn about how to manage Teams policies for channels. Teams policies control how users can interact with Teams and channels. This includes the availability of features for Teams. For example, whether private Teams are discovered in search result and whether users can create private Teams. If users are not assigned a custom policy by default, if users are not assigned a custom policy, the default global policy controls the available features. A user can only be assigned to one team policy at a time. Please note that the policy changes can take up to 24 hours to take effect. These teams policies are managed from Microsoft Teams Admin Center and through SharePoint Online and Commandlets using PowerShell. These Teams policy can be controlled by the following settings. The first one is Discover Private Teams. This settings control whether users can see private teams in a gallery view, which enables users to request access to a team. Create Private Channel settings controls whether users can create private channels or not. Restrict the creation of all wide teams. This settings control whether users are restricted from creating organizations-wide teams. This settings is only available through PowerShell. Let's go to the Teams Admin Center where I can show you how to apply this policy or create this policy for the users. So I'm on my Teams Admin Center now. So let's navigate to Teams and under Teams, select Teams Policies. You can either modify the global or wide default policy, or you can add a new one. Give a name for a user, for example, Alex. Create a public channel. After a new Teams policy is created, it must be assigned to a user. Assigning a new Teams policy to a user replaces either the existing default policy or existing custom policy for that user. So let's find out how to assign a user to a policy. You can select a policy 
and you can click on manage users this is where you will be able to search for a user and add a user so any sort of settings you applied for this policy is assigned to a particular user in this lesson we're going to learn about how to manage team settings managing team settings includes several options to control basic features of microsoft teams including notifications and feeds email integration cloud storage options and devices these settings are organizational wide settings and apply to all users and teams in an organization let me go and show you how and where you can find these options in the teams admin center so now i am on my teams admin center go to the org wide settings and click on team settings this is where you can find all the org wide team settings for your teams so there are policies which the first one which let you control whether users can be notified about activities of other users in teams this email integration area lets you control if the setting is turned on teams users can retrieve an email address to send email messages that the file area will let you control the availability of citrix files as third party storage provider in teams similarly for dropbox box google drive etc the organizational area this is where it shows or hide the organization tab in chat that shows additional data about a chat partner devices area will let you control things like whether users must provide a second form of authentication before entering a meeting this setting is especially useful when using surface hub devices where users can possibly join a meeting with the identity of a different user who is already logged on search by name allows you of scope directory searches from teams using exchange address books now that we have learned about team settings in this lesson we're going to learn about manage private channel creation policies for microsoft teams one way to restrict the creation of private channel is to let an administrator create a team policy that restricts private channel creation but team owners can also restrict the private channel creation on a per team level basis themselves this can be handy when team owners want to retain full control of their team activity which includes restricting members from creating private channels which team owners in turn cannot control to restrict team members from creating private channels a team owner must open the team from one of the microsoft teams client and manage the team so let's go and find out how to restrict anyone from creating a private channel within teams so i am in my teams app right now so i'm going to go to a particular teams and click on manage teams within manage team i can click on settings and expand the member permissions the second option under members permission is to allow members to create private channel so right now I have enabled anyone to create private channel within this particular team. I can go ahead and simply remove this. That will prevent anyone from creating a private channel within this team's app. So now that we have learned about how to restrict anyone from creating a private channel using policy, in this lesson we're going to learn about managing teams email integration. When integrating Microsoft Teams into existing messaging workflows to provide information through email to team members, it is possible to retrieve email address for any individual channels within a team. Let me quickly show you how to find an email address within a team. So now I am inside my Teams app. If I go to this Mark 8 project team, I go to my design channel. And within this channel, if I want to get the email address of the channel, all I have to do is click on this ellipsis and click on get email address. This would give me the email address for the teams. Any member can retrieve the email address of the channel by selecting the ellipsis icon to the right of the channel's name and then select get email address. Owners and users can remove the email address or they can modify advanced settings to restrict message delivery to team members and certain domains only. Please note that users can remove and reactivate channel email addresses, in which case a new user is generated and old address cannot be reused. 
Please note that users can remove or reactivate a channel's email address, in which case a new address is generated and old address cannot be reused. Now that we have learned about email integration in Microsoft Teams, in this lesson, we're going to learn about how to manage file sharing for Microsoft Teams. Sharing files is a basic operation in Office 365 and Microsoft Teams when collaborating with internal and external participants. The different operations in Teams result in different file handling operations to provide file access to one or many chat participants or all members of a single channel, including external guest access. There are different behavior related to sharing files depending on the sharing operation. The first one is, what about the user shares a file in a one-on-one -on -one group chat? In this behavior, the file is uploaded to users OneDrive into the folder Microsoft Teams chat files, and all participants are granted permission on the single file. Second operation is user shares a file in a conversation. In this operation, the expected behavior is the file is uploaded to the Teams documents library, where the Teams SharePoint permission groups grant access to all members and external participants. And the third operation is users copy the link to a file from Teams. In this operation, the expected behavior is the user can decide to copy a Teams or SharePoint link. While the Teams link opens Teams to access the file, the SharePoint links opens directly in the browser. The recipient of the link must either have a SharePoint permission or he or she must be a member of Teams to access the file content. So let me go and show you where is this settings in your SharePoint Admin Center or OneDrive Admin Center. I'm on my Microsoft 365 Admin Center. Under Admin Center, you can either go to SharePoint Admin Center or OneDrive Admin Center as well. So I'm going to go to SharePoint. Under SharePoint, you can go to Settings. Under SharePoint, you can go to Policies and click on Sharing. This is where you can find the sharing and external sharing options for both SharePoint and OneDrive. You would be able to modify it to give access to anyone, only new and existing guests, or existing guests, or only people in your organization. You can independently change the settings as well. So let me explain these policies one by one. Under anyone, users can create link that can be freely shared. They can also select to require sign-in when they share items. Under new and existing guests, users can send an invitation to anyone unless you choose to restrict domains. Invitation to access files can be redeemed only once. The next option is existing guests. Users can send sharing invitation to any external users who has been added to your Azure Active Directory. Invitation to access files can be redeemed only once. And finally, only people in your organization. In this case, external sharing is not allowed. Now that we have learned about Microsoft Teams sharing options, in this lesson, we're going to learn about how to manage channel moderation. Channel moderation allows team owners to control how users can participate in channel conversation. It is a useful feature to keep channel conversation under control within large channels. Where, for example, only selected users shall post update on a, pro on a project or a schedule. So here are the list of channel moderations restrict in channels. Why for the last sentence? So what channel moderators restrict in channels? The first one is starting new post in a channel. When this moderation is turned on for a channel, only moderators can start a new post in that channel. Let's go and see where you can see the channel moderation. So I'm in my Teams app. I'm going to select a channel and click on Manage channel. Under permission, this is where you can set the channel moderation permissions. Anyone can post, show alert that posting will notify everyone, or only owners can post messages. Now that we have learned about channel moderation, in this lesson, we're going to learn about how to manage settings for Teams apps. Teams apps let you do more in Teams. 
Think about the tools, files, and dashboards your organization has already used. Many of them can be added right into Teams. Teams apps provide out-of-box tools that enable your organization to maximize its Teams experience in the context of channel in a team, a group chat, or an individual user alone. These apps combine the functionality of tabs, messaging extensions, connectors, and bots provided by Microsoft built-in or by a third party or by a developer in your organization. There are several ways you can interact with the app services in Teams. First one is share content on a tab. When you work with different people, you want different information and different tools on hand. You can add relevant files and apps as tabs to any Teams conversation. Tabs help you add Tabs help you share content and functionality from your favorite services in a channel. They can connect you in Microsoft services like Excel, SharePoint, Power Apps, or other services like Asana, YouTube, Zendesk, etc. Or to a website of your choice as well. Second option is to get update from a connector. Connectors keep your team current by delivering content and updates directly to your channel from services you frequently use. With connectors, team users can receive updates from popular services such as Twitter, Trilio, Wonderlist, GitHub, and Azure DevOps services in their team's chats. Another option is to allow rich content. Another option is to add rich content to your messages. These apps can find content from different services and send it straight to a message. You can share things like weather reports, daily news, images, and videos with anyone you are talking to. Messages sometimes include buttons for interacting with the app. For example, a daily weather report could include an option to download the forecast for the entire week. Another option is to chat with a bot. These bots provide answers, updates, and assistance in private chats or channels. You can chat with them one on one or in a channel. Bots allow you to interact with cloud services such as task management, scheduling, and polling in Teams chat as well. Teams apps are a way to aggregate one or more capabilities into app packages that can be installed, upgraded, and uninstalled. In the Teams app section of the Microsoft Teams Admin Center, you can set policies to manage apps for your organization. For example, you can allow or block apps at an org level, set policies to control what apps are available to Teams users, and customize Teams by pinning the apps that are most important for your users. Use the Manage Apps page to view and manage all Teams app in your organization's app catalog. You can see the org level status and properties of the apps. Block or allow apps at an org level, Upload new custom apps to the tenant catalog and manage org-wide app settings as well. With app permission policies, you can control what apps are available to specific users in your organization. You can allow or block all apps or specific apps published by Microsoft, third parties, and your organization. For example, you can use app permission policy to gradually roll out a new third party or custom build apps to specific users or simplify the user experience, especially when you start rolling out teams across your organization. Admins and team owners can control whether a team allows for custom apps to be added to it. This allows members to upload custom app settings together with user custom apps policy, determines who can add custom apps to a particular team. Turn on the allow interaction with custom app settings in Microsoft Teams Admin Center for org-wide settings. For the team level, turn off the allowed members to upload custom apps for every team to which you want to restrict access. Now that we have learned about Teams apps, in this lesson, we're going to learn about Microsoft Teams meetings and conferencing. Once you have set up Teams, channels, and application within Microsoft Teams, the next step you can take is to add and customize the meeting settings and policies for audio conferencing, video, and sharing.
There are different types of meetings that you can create in Microsoft Teams, depending on the nature of the meeting. Private meeting, channel meeting, and ad hoc meeting or meet now. In private meeting is when you want to have a meeting with individual people, but you do not want the meeting to be visible to others. Channel meetings are scheduled in Teams team. All team members are automatically invited and will have access to discussion and recording. Ad hoc meeting is when you want to meet immediately at the current point in time without previously scheduling a meeting. Let's explore meeting policies. With meeting policies, you can permit and or restrict features that will be available to users during the meeting and audio conferencing. You must first decide if you are going to customize the initial meeting policies and whether you need multiple meeting policies. Then you must determine which group of users receive which meeting policies. Finally, you must determine whether your organization must purchase and deploy room system devices for your conference rooms. Let's understand the licensing concepts. Audio conferencing licenses are available part of Office 365 East. Audio conferencing licenses are available as part of Office 365 E5 subscription or add-on licenses to an existing subscription. As you plan for audio conference licensing, you must determine whether your organization is going to use Microsoft Teams live events. If the answer is yes, then you must determine who will be responsible for reporting and monitor usage. With Teams live events policies, you can manage event settings for groups of users. According to your organizational requirement, you can either continue to use the default policy or you can create additional policies that can be assigned to users who hold live events within your organization. Let's understand transcription service. During a meeting, users can optionally record the meeting and group calls as well as capture audio, video and screen sharing activity. In addition, recording can be automatically transcribed, which will enable the users to play back meeting recordings with closed captions and search for important discussion points in the transcript. To automatically transcribe a recording, you must turn on meeting transcription service. Now that we have understood from a high level point of view meeting and conferencing in Microsoft Teams, in this lesson, we're gonna learn about how to configure conference bridge within Microsoft Teams. Conferencing bridges allow users to dial into meetings through their phones. When configuring audio conferencing in your Office 365 environment, you will receive phone numbers for your users from what is called an audio conferencing bridge. These phone numbers are used when the user dial into a meeting. As an admin, you can choose to continue using the default settings for your conference bridge, or you can change the phone numbers and other settings. However, you must first decide if you need to add a new conferencing bridge number. Which number should you use by default? If you need to modify the bridge settings and whether you must port numbers to use with audio conferencing. Let's go and explore how to add additional conference bridges in the Microsoft Teams Admin Center. So I'm in my Teams Admin Center. On the left hand navigation pane, select Meetings and then select Conference Bridges. On the Conference Bridges page, this is where you can see all the available Conference Bridge number available. If you would like to add a new toll-free number, you can click on Add and select a toll-free number or a toll number. To define a default Conference Bridge, all you have to do is select a number and make this a default by selecting this tick box. If I want to change another default, if you, if you notice, if I change it to Moscow Ratio, I can set as a default by going into set as a default. You can configure conference bridge settings in Teams Admin Center by going into bridge settings. This is where you would be able to add and modify bridge settings details for meeting entry and exit notification, entry exit announcement type, ask caller to record their names before joining the meeting, pin length, etc. Now that we have learned about 
conferencing bridge settings in this lesson we're going to learn about managed meeting policies and settings in many organizations teams admins must control the features of meetings which the users within their organizations are scheduling many features are controlled by creating and managing meeting policies which are then assigned to users you can manage meeting policies within the teams admin center or by using windows powershell Meeting policies can be applied in three different ways: per organizer, per user, and per organizer and per user. In the per organizer mode, all meeting participants inherit the policy of the organizer. Only the per user policy applies to restrict certain features for the organizer and or meeting participants. Per organizer and per user, certain features are restricted. for meeting participants based on their policy and the organizer's policy let's go and find out how to create a new meeting policy i am in my teams admin center on the left hand navigation pane you can go to meetings and find meeting policies there you can click on add to create a new meeting policy enter your meeting policy name under general you have four options allow meeting allow meet now in channels allow the outlook add in allow channel meeting scheduling and allow scheduling private meetings then you have settings for your audio video content sharing and participants and guests as well microsoft teams provides meeting settings that determine whether anonymous users can join teams meeting customize meeting customize meeting invitations and if you want to enable quality of service if you change any of these meeting settings the changes will be applied to all team meetings some of the meeting settings are participants email invitation and network settings let me go let me quickly go and show you where to find this meeting settings under teams admin center within meetings you can go to meeting settings this is where you can find settings for participants email invitation and network settings participants with this option you define whether anonymous participants can join a meeting with email invitation if your organization have specific meeting needs and requirements concerning the meeting invitation you can customize them here if you are using quality of service to prioritize network traffic you can enable qos and set port ranges for each type of media traffic now that we have learned about meeting settings in this lesson we're going to learn about live events in microsoft microsoft teams offers users chat based collaboration calling meetings and live events a live event is created for one to many communication where the host of the event leads the interactions and audience participation is primarily geared to viewing the content shared by the host the attendees can watch the live or recorded event in yammer teams or stream and they can also interact with the presenters using moderated q and a or yammer conversation for live events Microsoft Teams provides an option that enables users to expand their meeting audience by broadcasting video and meeting content online to large audiences of up to 10,000 attendees. Enterprise Content Delivery Network enables you to take video content from the internet and distribute it through your enterprise without impacting network performance. The most important aspect of using live events in Microsoft Teams is to provide the attendees a great user experience without having to deal with any issues. The attendee experience uses Azure Media Player for events produced in Teams and Stream Player for events produced in external app or device. In Microsoft Teams Admin Center, the tenant admins can view real-time usage analytics for live events. The live event usage report provides an overview of live event activities held in an organization. Now that we have learned on a high level what is live events, in this lesson we're going to learn about how to manage live event policies. I'm on my Microsoft Teams admin center. To manage live event policy, go to meetings tab, expand it and select live event policies. You can modify an existing policy or you would be able to create a new policy. Give a name for your policy. and select would you like to allow scheduling allow transcription for attendees who can join schedule event everyone within your organization or a specific user or group 
who can record an event or you can keep it as always record so you can view it in streams as well. Settings for live event that are held within your company can be configured in Microsoft Teams Admin Center. The administrator can set up a support URL and configure a third-party video distribution provider. Let's go and explore how to do that. I'm in my Teams Admin Center. To modify live event settings, under meetings, go to live event settings. This is where you would be able to customize the URL or use a third-party distribution provider. And you can select the provider over here. As of now, you have two provider, Hive and Collective. Once you pick a provider, you can enter the provider by using provider name, enter the license ID, which you have received from your provider contact, and enter the API template URL, which you have received from your provider contact as well. Using live events in YAML can provide your Office 365 users with the ability to produce live events directly in the YAML. Live events support up to 10,000 attendees in the same moment from anywhere using the attendees device or computer. If you decide to record the live event, you can make the video available after the event. So the people who cannot attend at the scheduled time can still participate. Now that we have learned about the live event settings and policies, in this lesson, we're going to learn about managed phone numbers. Microsoft Teams includes cloud voice capabilities that are delivered from Office 365 and provide private branch exchange or PBX functionality. Phone system in Microsoft Teams allow users to place and receive calls, transfer calls, and mute or unmute calls. Within Microsoft Phone system, calls between users in your organization are handled internally. However, to enable calls to landlines and mobile phones, phone system must be connected to the PSTN, and PSTN connection can be established in two ways calling plan and direct routing. Establish and receive calls directly through your Office 365 phone system as a telephony provider by purchasing Microsoft Calling Plan. This includes both domestic or domestic and international for Office 365. In direct routing, you can connect your current on-premises PBX infrastructure with the Office 365 phone system by using direct routing. Licensed users can call out to numbers located in the country or region where they are assigned in their Office 365. Under domestic and international calling plan, licensed users can call out to numbers located in the country or region where their Office 365 license is assigned to the user based on the user location and to the international number in the supported country or regions. You must meet these following infrastructure requirements to deploy a direct routing solution in your organization. Before you can assign phone numbers to the users or services in your organization, you must first get the phone numbers. There are three ways you can get the phone number. Using the Microsoft Teams Admin Center, go to your existing number and use a request form for new numbers. For some countries or regions, you can get numbers for your users using the Microsoft Teams Admin Center. You can port or transfer existing numbers from your current service provider or phone carrier. Finally, depending on your country or region, you may not be able to get your new number using Microsoft Teams Admin Center, or you will need a specific phone number or area codes. In either case, you will need to download a form, complete it, and return it to Microsoft. There are two types of phone number, user number and service number. User numbers can be assigned to users in your organization for calling purposes. Service numbers are assigned to services such as audio conferencing or to attendance and call queues. Let's go to the Teams Admin Center and find out how to get new phone numbers in the Teams Admin Center. You can go under Voice and click on Phone Numbers. If you have added any number, you would be able to see over here or you can click on port to port a new number or you can simply add and select the country, region, number type, call queue, auto attendant, dedicated conference bridge and provide the rest of the details to add a new number within your phone system. An emergency location may be referred to as a civic address, street address or physical address. An emergency location is associated with a place to give you a more exact location within a building. A place is typically a floor, building wing, or an 
office number where the user is located. When adding emergency location for your organization, it is recommended that you follow the steps like plan for emergency location, add emergency location, and get phone number. And finally, assign phone numbers. Please note that take extra care when configuring and maintaining your organizational emergency location as they can literally impact the life or death of your employees. Several countries or regions have strict law that require company to ensure the availability of an emergency phone number in the event of an accident. Let's go and show you how to add emergency address on the Microsoft Teams Admin Center. So I'm in my Teams Admin Center. Go under locations, click on emergency address. This is where you would be able to add a new emergency address for your tenant. Pick a country and fill out the details with all the valid information. After you have finished setting up a calling plan in your organization, you must assign phone numbers to your users. You can also manage and remove users phone number if need be. So let me show you where you can add phone numbers for your users. I'm in my team's admin center. Go under voice. And this time you're going to select phone numbers. I don't have any number added for a user, but this is where you can come and add a user phone number and you can find out who you assign to. And once you have assigned a number, then you can go back to a user and click on a particular user. And under the account tab, this is where you would be able to see the information and you can modify the number as well. Voice setting for users include call sharing and group call pickup feature for Microsoft Teams, which let users share their incoming calls with colleagues so that their colleagues can answer calls that occur while the user is unavailable. You can modify the voice settings and you can view the details over here in the Teams Admin Center. In this lesson, we're going to learn about how to manage phone system for Microsoft Teams. A resource account is a disabled user object in Azure Active Directory. It is used to represent objects other than users. For example, in Exchange, it can represent conference groups and in Teams, it allows each conference group to have a phone number. Phone system call queues and auto attended must have at least one associated resource account in Microsoft Teams. Let me show you how to create resource account in Microsoft Teams Admin Center. So you can go under Microsoft Teams Admin Center, go to org wide settings, click on resource accounts. As of now, I don't have any details, but this is where you can come and create a new resource account. And you can select, is it a call queue or auto attended? With cloud call queues, you can add different feature for calling, such as a greeting message, music while playing, Music while people are waiting on hold, redirecting calls to call agents in mail enabled distribution list and security groups, setting different parameters such as queue maximum size, timeout, and call handling options. Let me quickly show you where you can configure that. I'm in my team's admin center. Go under voice and click on call queues. As you can see that I don't have any call queues available at the moment. Click on add give a name and you can add an account or a resource account select the language and you can select do you want to add a greeting or would you like to upload a audio file do you want to play music on hold or play an audio file all of the queue related items can be modified and updated in this particular auto attendance enable both external and internal callers to use menu system to locate and place calls to users or departments in your organization. When people call a number that is associated with an auto attendant, their choices can redirect the call to a user or locate someone else in your organization and then connect to that user. Let me quickly go and show you where you would be able to add auto attendant with an existing resource account. I'm in my team's admin center under voice you can click on auto attendance. Click on add, give a name, and select the details like who is the operator, a person in organization, voice app, or an external phone number, what time zone, and what sort of a language it is. In the advanced settings, this is where you can add details like greeting information and where would you like to route the call next. 
call flow will give you option to set your business hours, set up after our call flow, and then route the call details as well. This is where you would be able to upload your holiday call settings. You can add a resource account and assign phone number to the resource account here. Call Park, which is available in Teams only mode, enables a user to place a call on hold in Teams service in the cloud. For example, a user phone is running out of battery. So the user decide, so the user decides to park a call and then retrieve the call from Teams desk phone. To park and retrieve calls, a user must be an enterprise voice user. And an administrator must grant the user a call park policy. So let me quickly show you how to enable a call park policy in Teams Admin Center. So I'm in my Teams Admin Center. On the left hand side, under voice, you can find call park policies. You can edit an existing policy or you can create a new policy. This will give you an option to allow car, allow call park option, call pickup start range, and in time and park timeout options as well. Calling policies in Microsoft Teams help you determine which calling and call forwarding feature will be available to your users. Let's go and explore how to enable a call calling policy. I'm on my Teams admin center. Under voice, you can find calling policies. I'm going to modify an existing policy to show you what are the options available. You have option to you have an option available to make private calls, call forwarding, voicemail, inbound call routed, inbound call routing, busy on busy, PST and calling, etc. Caller ID policies in Microsoft Teams can help you change or block the caller. It is set up by default so that when a Teams user calls a PST and phone, their phone number is visible. Caller ID policies are managed in Microsoft Teams Admin Center in Voice section. Let's go and find out how to do that. So I'm in my Teams Admin Center. Under Voice, you can click on Caller ID policies. I'm going to modify an existing Caller ID policy. This is where you have options like Block incoming Caller ID, Override the Caller ID policies, Replace the Caller ID, and Replace the Caller ID with a service number. The direct routing health dashboard can help you monitor the connection between your session border, the connection between your SBC and direct routing interface. This can give you details like your overall health, detailed information about your SBC and network effectiveness ratio. In this lesson, we're going to learn about Microsoft Teams add-on licensing. Add-on licensing for voice capabilities and phone system features provide additional Teams features to users with an active subscription plan. For example, if a user is licensed with Microsoft 365 E3 and wants to use calling features for voice communication, you can purchase a phone system add-on license and a calling plan license to provide usage rights for the phone system of your Office 365 and credits to perform your phone calls. Depending on which plan you already have, the following add-on licenses are available to provide Microsoft Teams and voice calling features. Audio conferencing enables users to provide dial-in phone number for Teams meetings. Toll-free numbers enables users to add regional toll-free dial-in phone number for conferencing. Phone system options enables users to use Teams with traditional on-premises and cloud PBX phone system solutions that provide calling to PSTN. Calling plans enable users to call any phone number outside of your business. There are domestic calling plans and domestic and international calling plans. Microsoft Teams Rooms enable you to use capable devices for connecting video, audio, and content sharing features to conference room. In this lesson, we're going to learn about how to troubleshoot audio, video, and client issues. Troubleshooting problems within Microsoft Teams may include a wide array of possible areas that you need to investigate, starting from the Teams client up to the coexistent mode settings configured by your Teams administrator. Most issues discovered with Microsoft Teams client can be tracked back to firewall or proxy connectivity. Verifying the necessary URLs, IP address, and ports are opened in your firewall or proxy 
will minimize unnecessary troubleshooting. Clearing the Microsoft Teams client cache is the recommended first step to troubleshoot if you discover any information mismatches, such as incorrect display name. There are three types of log files that are automatically produced by client that can be leveraged to assist troubleshoot Microsoft Teams. Debug or diagnostic logs, media logs, and desktop or bootstrapper logs. Troubleshooting Teams and Sky for Business users is a very complex process that require you to understand the concepts of that require you to understand the concept of coexistence for Microsoft Teams, namely Teams coexistence mode and federation. Call analytics can help you troubleshoot call and connection problems with Microsoft Teams. Call analytics show detailed information about devices, networks, connectivity for the calls and meetings of each user in your Office 365 account where call analytics is designed to help admins and help desk agents troubleshoot the call quality problems with specific calls. The call quality dashboard or CQD is designed to help teams admins and network engineers optimize a network. CQD shift focus from specific user and instead look to aggregate information for an entire teams organization. Microsoft Call Quality Power BI Connector enable you to build your own custom reports. You can use customizable Power BI templates predefined by Microsoft as a starting point for your new report layout, data models, and queries. All right, so that's the end of this course. Please do remember to use Microsoft Learn content to complement this lecture content. And thank you so much for taking time to learn this course. I will see you on the next one. Until then, take care.